Hey, assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. My name is Samhar Alouch. I'm a second year medical student. And today, me and uh, my colleague, Mohamed Haddad, are going to explain the inflammation lecture, part one and part two. Uh, before I start, let me orient you a little bit. In uh, part one, I'm going to explain the exact things that Dr. Abdul Jabbar explained and a little bit of uh, part two which is not really in part one, which is the toll-like receptors and dams and bumps if you studied the lecture before. So before any further ado, let's start. So inflammation and healing, uh, here you can find my email, here you can find my number if you want to ask me any questions. And if you have any questions, just, yeah, you can interrupt me and ask, it's okay. First, is my voice clear? Okay, let's start. So first, uh, he starts, uh, let's start Yanni, with the, talking about uh, brief immunology. So immunology deals with the uh, physiologic function of the immune system in health and, uh, in health and disease. So Yanni, immunology is the study of your immune system and this stuff. The immune system is the body defense mechanism against disease by identifying and killing pathogens and tumor cells. So your immune system has like many cells it's, they are listed here, neutrophils, basophils, and this stuff, T cells, B cells, all of these uh, cells are working against any uh, tumor, any microbes, any anything that's happened abnormally in your body. They are the defense mechanism that makes sure that your body is in the homeostasis and it's normal, nothing happening abnormally. We have some immunological disorder like autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases is like when you, let's say let's say we have the T cells. This is an, our immune cells. T cells usually uh, attack or I, 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 first I, they identify the microbes, the, the abnormal things that enter to your bodies through their receptors. We will talk about that later. They have some receptors that to identify these uh, abnormal things and then they attack them, kill them and whatever. If those T cells identify yourself uh, cells, I mean, the normal cells in your body, sometimes they identify them as abnormal and they start attacking your own cells, your self cells. And that's what's called autoimmune disease. There is hypersensitivity diseases. It's like when you have an allergic reaction, like an immune response to something that's normal. I mean, you just eat uh, peanut butter, which is normal. It's not something abnormal, but still it's abnormal to your body. So sometimes your body recognizes these abnormal things, which is healthy, like the peanut butter, as a dangerous thing and starts attacking them and starts an immune response. That's the hypersensitivity. There is immune deficiency. It's like when you have a weak defense system, weak immune system, like you're, uh, you are not developing neutrophils or basophils, let's say. So you have a very weak immune system that all microbes are invading and killing uh, your cells. And there's transplant rejection. It's like when you transplant, an, let's say, a kidney from one person to another, this uh, guy A, uh, we transplant his kidney to guy B. Guy B, uh, autoimmune system, attack this kidney because it's abnormal to his body and kill it. So sometimes we have transplant rejection. All of these, uh, uh, all of these diseases in the immune system are from malfunctioning of the immune system. Uh, then let's talk about this picture. Uh, the immune system uh, is made of two uh, types of organs, primary and secondary lymphoid organ. The primary lymphoid organ are thymus and bone marrow. And usually these organs are the organs that develop the immune cells, especially the T cells and B cells, the, ad the adaptive immunity. So primary lymphoid organ are thymus and bone marrow. Thymus is here, you probably took it in anatomy, and it disappears when you get older. So it's just when you are young to make the T cells. And then when you get older, it disappears. Uh, then we have secondary lymphoid organ. That's where the, these T cells and B cells yani, mature more and, uh, and uh, yani, start to know how to work. And these are tone cells, adenoids, and lympho lympho lymph nodes. And probably you took it in histology with Dr. Khalid. We have others like malt, gut, and pulp. Uh, they are specific lymphoid tissue in specific areas, like let's say uh, gut are in the GI, pulp are in the bronchus. So 
you probably took them in histology. So this slide is just a bit of orientation. We have tissue cells, which macrophage, dendritic cells, mast cells, and we have the blood cells listed here. And you probably took it with Dr. Rayhan. This slide, Dr. Abdul Jabbar said he expects you to know nothing from it because yani, most likely it's just a revision or just orientation. So yani, if there is any new info here, yani, just ignore because he said nothing is important in this slide. So now let's start to get to the real thing. By the way, this part is from inflammation too. So and if you didn't find it in your slides, it's okay. Uh, so now let's just wait a second. Yes. Okay. So now let's uh, orient you a little bit more. The immune system is like this. We have uh, in our body the T cells, B cells, uh, neutrophils. All of these cells are uh, immune cells. Okay. These immune cells uh, have receptors on their uh, surface or inside them, but most likely it's on their surface. This receptor is to identify, is this something normal or abnormal? So now you ate a food, uh, you ate, let's say, ice cream. This ice cream is something new to your body. So it goes to this receptor. It binds to the receptor. Then the receptor recognizes, is this something safe or dangerous if it's safe it just ignore it and let it skip if it's dangerous it uh, activates an immune response to kill it okay so if and um, microbes invaded your body let's say bacteria the bacteria go and binds to this receptor now the t-cells uh, when the when it binds to its receptor it recognizes oh this is dangerous this is abnormal so it activates an immune response and kill it kill it and uh, summon more T cells and more immune response and cause inflammation. So that's the way uh, our body recognizes the microbes. Like, are they safe or dangerous? So how does the immune cells know if this is dangerous or self? We have receptors. And these receptors, the one I talked about, we said T cells have receptors on their uh, head, let's say, on the surface. These receptors called BRRs. BRR, button, uh, button recognition receptors. What does that mean? What button mean? It means that, let's say the, bacte uh, the bacteria usually have a cell membrane or cell wall. This cell wall has specific pattern, okay? A specific pattern of amino sites, okay? This pattern is recognized by these receptors to say, oh, this is dangerous, let's kill it. So these receptors are recognizing the patterns that are in the microbes and uns uh, unsafe. Uh, microbes or things that enter to our body. So they are called BRRs, button uh, recognition receptors. So now if I ask you, what are the receptors that's on T cells or B cells or any immune cells? It is BRRs. We have two types, actually we have more, but in the lecture, he mentioned two types of uh, BRRs. The first one is TLR, which is toll-like receptor. And this is the major one, Yanni. Most of the things is on TLRs. The other one is NLRs, which is not like receptor. You have to memorize them because, Yanni, at the end of this slide, we will talk about the function of each two. So now we know that the T cells have two types of surface receptor. The first one is TLR. The second one is NLR. Okay? So now the immune cell surface receptor go and bind to this, the suspected cell. And if it's normal, it's igno it ignores it. If it's abnormal, it, it causes the immune response. And we explained that uh, before. So what is considered abnormal? Because everything is normal except the abnormal things. Yani everything you eat, everything is always in your body is considered normal except the specific things. What are these specific things? We have two things that considered abnormal called BAMs and DAMs. Let's start with BAMs, just a second. Let's start with BAMs. If a bacteria entered into your body, this is a bacteria, and it has its cell wall. These cell walls have any yani, specific structure, specific antigens, let's say. These antigens from our body is considered as abnormal. These abnormal things that the microbes had, microbes or, or virus or anything that is pathogenic, is called BAMs. So BAMs are any pathogenic stuff that entered to our body and our body consider it as dangerous. And that's what the B uh, at the beginning refers to, pathogenic. So that's the first one, BAMs. BAMs are the bacterial uh, components that are considered abnormal by our uh, body. 
So these BAMs go and bind, let's say, to the toll-like receptor, and the toll-like receptor activates the immune response. The other type called DAMs. And DAMs, it's actually video. Uh, DAMs is, D here referred to damage. What does that mean? It means, let's say you have your cell, your normal cell. Uh, let's say the, the, the GI cells, okay? This is the cell. It has nucleus, it has mitochondria, let's say. It has many other structures and it has the surface membrane. These structures are inside the bacteria. So normally our T cells or B cells or any, any immune cells don't know what's happening inside these cells. They just know the surface of them. That's why the TLR or uh, NLR, uh, when they go and uh, when they go and bind to these cells, they bind to the surface and they know, oh, this surface is normal, so let's ignore it. We don't want to initiate an immune response. But imagine if the things that inside these cells are leaked out, like the, the membrane is damaged, and now we have the cytosol and mitochondria and these things are out. When they bind to the TLR or NLR, it causes an immune reaction because this NLR doesn't know them. They consider them as dangerous because they used to the surface membrane. They don't know what's happening inside. So, it, so when uh, the membrane rupture and the inside of the cell gets out and binds to the NLR, it causes an immune reaction. And that's called DAMPs. DAMPs are anything inside the normal cells of our body that if they get leaked out, our body will uh, cause an immune reaction. So now we have two things, BAMPs and DAMPs. BAMs are pathogen associated molecular patterns. So they are patterns in pathogenic stuff like bacteria. And these are bacterial components of the bacteria that invade our body. Our immune cell identify them and cause an immune response. The other type is DAMs, which is damage associated molecular patterns. And these are inner components of our normal cells. It's the normal cells we have, but it's out in the inner components, uh, which normally not presented in our immune cells. So when cell damage occur and the dams leak, this inside things leaks out, the immune cells identify them and cause an immune response. And we have the whole inflammation thing. Is it clear? Or I'm going too fast. Okay, now dams and BAMs, DAMs, we said it's the one related to the normal cells and BAMs is related to the bacteria, are identified by BRRs. That's what we said. DAMs and BAMs, the damage associated and the BAMs, the pathogenic associated, are identified by BRRs. What's BRRs? The TLR and uh, NLR. DAMs, the one related to our normal cells, is identified by NLRs. Okay. The BAMs is the one identified by TLRs. So DAMPS, the one related to our cells, is identified by NLRs. And you can you know, you know it's by DN, you know, D, and if you didn't study, you will get you know, something like this. So DAMPS, NLRs, and you have BAMS relate, uh, related to TLRs. Is it clear? So if, if he brings you an MCQ asking, that there are dams, uh, yani a, a cellular injury wh where the cells get out and then acute inflammation happens. Which type of receptor that identi yani identified these dams? It is NLRs. If he brings like a bacteria invaded someone's body and an immune reaction happened, what type of receptor? You say TLRs, okay? Now, it's not enough to know BAMs and DAMs. Yani bacteria has many things in its cell wall and inside it are considered BAMs. So BAMs is way much vague word. We need to know what are the BAMs, okay? And also for our normal cells, for the DAMs, there are many things inside our cells that are considered DAMs. So we need to know them. So let's start first by BAMs. It's infectious. And the source is extrinsic, which means it's by a pathogen from outside, and it's considered by TLRs. And the location of the TLR is cell uh, surface, uh, whatever. And the examples of those uh, BAMs are the LBS of the bacteria, uh, the lipotoic acid, the flagellin, the body IC. Uh, he mentioned them, so I think you need to memorize them. 
because he mentioned them, but don't go يعني, so deep, يعني, don't actually memorize the spelling. That's just no LBS, LIPO, something, CBG, like this. And uh, the response is pro-inflammatory response. The other one is DAMS, which is endogenous, which means you know, it's from our cell cells, okay, from our body itself. That's the uh, DAMS, and it's uh, by LNRs, which is not like receptor, the location is the cytosol. And what's considered uh, as DAMS, I mean, this is our cell, and there are many things in, inside it. What is considered DAMS? The heat shock protein, uric acid cluster, hyaluronin, uh, heparin sulfate, defensin. You need actually to memorize them, especially these two. He mentioned them a lot. Also, the first one. So, and this one also, you, the uric acid crystal, he said it's the one related to gout disease. So at least the first four, you need to memorize them. It's something inside the cell that if it leaks out, it will cause an immune reaction. Is it clear? Shall I repeat something? Okay. Now we said, uh, that the toll-like receptor go and uh, yani this this the T cell and it has the toll-like receptor. This toll-like receptor binds the uh, binds the what's called BAMs and cause the immune reaction. Is that it? Yani is, there is a specific pathway that if the BAMs bind to the TLRs, cause the formation of the specific pathway. So let's start first. TLR, toll-like receptors, are receptors that identify BAMs. We said that from before, to initiate an immune response. We have two types of TLRs. We have surface TLRs and uh, intracellular TLRs. Just a second. Okay. The cell surface, yani, let's say we have a cell. This is, this is the T cell. We have TLR on its surface, and we have TLR inside its surface on an endosome. We have something called endosome, and we have TLR uh, above it. The TLR on the surface uh, recognize specific pathogens. We don't know to need, uh, yeah, you don't uh, need to know them. Specific pathogens that go to the surface, TLR uh, recognize them. There are other pathogens, other bacteria, viruses that invade. Yeah, the TLR on the surface can't catch them. It just invade. Those bacteria just invade. So how will we recognize them? We have a TLR inside our cells on an endosome, it binds to them and it identifies them and cause the immune reaction. So we have two types of TLR, one on the surface to get the things that uh, come on the surface, and we have TLR inside the cell, it's for the things that invade the membrane and enter inside the cell. These are the things he said don't memorize them, so don't memorize them. Just know, and the types of TLR, you don't need to know this, just know that there is a TLR on the surface and the TLR inside the cell in an endosome or any on an endosome. Okay, now what happened after it binds? We have this TLR, it binds to that BAM, and then what? The aim of the whole thing is that this TLR activate something called NFKB. So once the BAM binds to the TLR, the aim of the whole process that's going to happen is to activate something called NFKB. If the aim is to, is the, is to activate NFKB, this means that NFKB is actually inactive before this binding. So we have now in our cell something called NFKB. This NFKB is normally inactive. The aim of this whole pathway of BAMB and TLR is to activate NFKB. Okay, and when NFKB is activated, it will cause the uh, the inflammation reaction. So what's NFKB? NFKB actually is like this. It's a transcription factor that you know, something go into the nucleus and cause the formation of many proteins. Okay, so NFKB is a transcription factor. But this transcription factor is inactive. Why? Because we have something else binds to this NFKB. It's like this. It holds it, prevents it from doing its action, and it's called IKB. So now we have NFKB wants to do the action, but we have IKB, which prevents it from doing the action. It's like, no, don't do an inflammation. There is no need for that. They are like this. And there is no need for inflammation. It's, it grabs it. So now once BAMS 
binds to the TLR, it activates something called IKB kinase. And from what you know, kinase is something that causes phosphorylation. So when BAM binds to the TLR, it activates IKB kinase, which go and phosphorylate IKB with, uh, to phosphor, uh, phosphate. And once IKB is phosphorylated, it causes it to dissociate. So now once it dissociates, we have NFKB as, uh, not like this, okay. Uh, we have NFKB free, active, and do its action. How does it do its action? It go inside the nucleus and cause the tra uh, transcription uh, of new proteins, which is cytokines, chemical mediators. My friend will uh, explain in detail after my class. So now, Let's recap. We have cell surface TLR on the surface of the membrane and intracellular TR inside the cell on an endosome. How do they exert their action? Their aim is to activate NFKB. NFKB is nuclear factor KB. Normally, NFKB is bound to IKB, which inactivates it. We said it's like this. It holds it. So now we have IKB inactivating NFKB. So how it became active? Once TLR binds to BAMs, it, uh, uh, yeah, once TLR binds to BAMs, it activates something called IKB kinase. IKB kinase go and phosphorylate I the IKB, which cause it to get released or removed. So now we have an activated NFKB. NFKB go to the nucleus and activates transcription of cytokines and chemokines that cause the immune response. Here we have the diagram. I'll go over it last time. So as I said, we have uh, IKB kinase, which gets activated when it bind, when BAM binds to a TLR. I, IKB kinase phosphorylate the IKB, this one, it phosphorylated, cause it to get dissociated. And now we have the active NFKB. Active NFKB enter to the nucleus and cause transcription of uh, many other proteins that cause the immune reaction. And finally, we reach the first checkpoint. So do you have any question? This NFK, NFKB part is a little bit hard, so make sure you understand it fully. Okay, so no, no question at all. By the way, we have question to solve, but it's at the end of the lecture, so I prefer that you know, to solve everything once. So let's continue then, if you have no question. Okay, now we said that when a pathogen uh, enter our body to like receptor, recognize it and cause an immune reaction. That's for BAMs. Let's talk about DAMs now. DAMs is when our cells die. And when they die, they release their uh, stuff, the inside things. Uh, the ones we mentioned, and these stuff, stuff considered damp, bind to the nod-like receptor, and once they bind, they activate an immune reaction. So now let's talk about the cell death. Normally, we have the cell. It's living, it has its, uh, that's the cell. It's living, it has its own oxygen, uh, uh, its own ATB. Uh, you know, there is the uh, sodium uh, potassium uh, bump the sodium potassium bump, which works with the ATB. It has all the things yani, it needs to live. Imagine if there is a stress occurred to this cell. Uh, let's say there is an artery supply this cell and we included this artery. So now there is no oxygen anymore. If there is no oxygen, there will be no ATB because you know the glycolysis stuff. There, is, there will be no ATB. And if there is no ATB, this NAK bump won't work at all. This is one type of stress. There are many other types of stress, like radiation, trauma. There are many others. But let's talk about hypoxia now, uh, which is the loss of oxygen. Now, imagine if it lost the oxygen. At the beginning, it can yani, still live. So if we open this artery once again, it's going to revert back to its normal and we have a healthy cell. But imagine if this gets prolonged and we have no oxygen anymore. This NAK BAM will not work anymore. So this cell will have edema. It will swell because yani, usually the NAK, uh, the uh, sodium potassium BAM cause the yani, movement of uh, water and things into the cell, yani, maintain its concentration. 
So now if it's gone and we have no ATP left, this cell will swell. So now from this square into these things, it's gonna be like this. This cell will swell. And after it swell, it's gonna rupture. So if it's ruptured, it's gonna be like this. If it's ruptured, the inside things will get out. And these are dumps. And once they are out, they will bind to the uh, node like receptor and cause an immune reaction. This is how usually cell, uh, our normal cells die suddenly. Okay, so now let's go back. When stress occurred to a cell, like a hypoxia, it became injured. If this stress is gone, the cell go back to normal. However, if it persists, persists, sorry, it's caused cell death. Cell death can happen the way I said it, but it can happen other way. So we have two types of cell death, necrosis and apoptosis. Necrosis is the one I, I have talked about. So necrosis is, is something that activates the immune response. Why does it activate the immune response? Because the dams get out. And once the dams get out, it activates the immune response. So necrosis activate the immune system. Uh, how necrosis happen? I just explain that when you have hypoxia, let's say the cell will swell. So then uh, it will burst, spilling the contents and lysosome enzymes out. So it will rupture and everything inside it will get out and it will cause an inflammatory response, okay? Uh, and uh, this necrosis cause dams to get out. The other type is apoptosis. I want to revise uh, necrosis one last time. So we have a normal cell, we have hypoxia, causing no NAKTB uh, to work. So the cell will swell because there is no ATB, nothing normal anymore. It will swell, then because of the swelling, it will rupture. And once it ruptures, the dams will get out. And once dams get out, it will cause an inflammatory response. That's so much unorganized. And if you saw, the cell will swell. It's going to get bigger. Okay, the other type we have is apoptosis. Apoptosis is the cell die without bursting apart. So it dies, but without getting swelled and rupture and these things. Now, it's a very well-organized death. Okay, and the death everyone wants to have. Uh, apoptosis cell die without bursting apart. There is no damage and no substance release. But how? How does it die without releasing any substance? Uh, and since there is no release of any substance, there is no inflammatory response because there is no dumps. If there is no dumps, there is no inflammation. So apoptosis was a very organized death that caused nothing to get out and there is no inflammatory response. And that's a perfect death, okay? How does uh, apoptosis occur? So now you have the cell and the hypoxia or whatever happened. Uh, there is a specific pathway with proteins and genes. You will take it in mole. So, and Dr. Abdul Jabbar said he will not ask about these things, uh, you know, the specific things, the genes and this stuff in uh, HLS. So he just want the general picture, okay? So now you have the cell. You damage its nuclear uh, membrane, the nuclear protein or whatever. So it realizes that it will die. She, the, the, the cell knows that it will die. So it's organized its death, uh, its death and cause a program cell death. What happened? This, this, uh, this, uh, the squares uh, membrane get divided into many other squares. Actually, it's not square. It's uh, circles, but I love squares. Okay. So it gets into many squares. Each square has the components of whatever, but these squares are a membrane. So there is still the membrane that our body knows. So the TLR, when it saw these small squares, saw them, oh, this is the membrane that I know. This is the membrane that I know. This is the membrane they, uh, that I know. It doesn't, uh, yani, it doesn't cause the, these things inside to get out. It's, it envelops them, engulf them with a membrane, small membranes and release them out. So we have these small squares and uh, the TLRs bind them, they say, oh, they are normal. So there is no inflammation. Then other cells come and phagocytose them and degrade them, and that's it. We have a very organized death without any inflammation. So is it clear? We will revise them once again here in the diagrams. And I want to say them in my way, my drawing. So is it clear? Okay. So now, uh, the apoptosis is a very organized death. 
we have two types of apoptosis, the physiological and pathological. Physiological is actually something, is not, it's not a disease, it's normally happening. Our body wants to remove some cells. Like, yani, let's say when, when, you, when you are uh, developing in the uterus of the mom, normally our hand starts to be like this. It's just one hand. There is no, no, no fingers. Then our body causes apoptosis in some lines here to cause our hand to become like this. Okay, so now we have these spaces. These cells died, but our body wants it to die. So that's the physiological apoptosis. The apoptosis, the cell death that happened because our body wants it. And it can be in embryogenesis and fetal development, the one I mentioned. It can be hormone independent. It can be death uh, because, because, of, uh, serve, you know, because they ended their function. You know, a cell did its function, like, like the thymus. The thymus, we said it, it gets removed once we get older because it served its function. There is no function of it anymore. So it causes apoptosis to itself and die. And let's say the uterus again, uh, when the mom gets pregnant, the, the, normally the uterus is so small. When it gets pregnant, it became so much big. And once you know, she gave birth, the uterus needs to go back to be like this. So uh, it causes apoptosis, which is a death that our body wants it to happen. And it go back to normal. The other type is pathological. It's because of a disease or a damage or a trauma or hypoxia or ma many other reasons, but they are pathological. They are not normal. So it's apoptosis due to pathological condition like DNA damage or, uh, or radiation, chemotherapy, accumulation of misfolded protein, organ atrophy after uh, duct obstruction. So these are pathological situations that cause the cell to die, but this death is very well organized that it causes no inflammation. Dr. Abdul Jabbar actually said there is no need to know the physiological and pathological examples here. So just know the that apoptosis can be physiological, which uh, is planned in our body, or pathological is due to a disease. He said there is no need to know these examples. I actually removed more examples. They were like 10. So just don't know the example. Just know the whole concept. So now again, we have necrosis and apoptosis. Necrosis is when there is a damage. Uh, suddenly, so our body, uh, yani the cells die without any plan. And these, uh, when they die, the cells swell first and the internal structure gets released. And when once dams get released, it will cause an inflammation. The other type is apoptosis is when our body either plan the death or there is a pathology, but our body can handle it. So it caused the, plan, uh, the death to be planned perfectly to cause no uh, inflammation. And this... Uh, this uh, death is without any swell. Actually, the cell shrink caused it to have the small uh, squares, as we said here, the small, small squares. And since the squares are covered with the normal membrane, there is no inflammation because dams are not released. Is it clear? That's very important. That helps you in mole and uh, here. So please, you must understand it. Okay. Now, the last time to recap it, but here we have some info, in, not, not just a recap. Necrosis with apoptosis. Uh, as we said, necrosis, we have a sudden damage, a hypoxia, the NAKTB thing is not working. So the cell actually swell. Now it swelled, it gets bigger, bigger, bigger till it burst. And the dams are released and it causes inflammation. It is accidental, as we said, usually affect large area, Cell and organelles swell, so we have a cell swell, even the organelle inside swell, and uh, the cell rupture and the uh, contents inside get released and cause an inflammation. The other type is apoptosis. We have the cell normally, then it gets shrinked. Notes here, how is it smaller than the normal uh, cell? It gets shrink, it gets divided into small squares, but here it's not squares actually, it's circles, it get divided into small circles, and then these circles get phagocytosed by other cells and they degrade them and that's it. There is no inflammation, no dams and nothing. So it's programmed, uh, affects individual cell, cell contracts, not swell. So if he asks you what's, you know, there's a cell death with the swell, you choose necrosis. If it's contract or shrink, you chose apoptosis. And uh, it doesn't cause any inflammation. And these, these small squares or small circles are called apoptotic bodies, okay? 
So last time, is this clear? Because we will move to another whole thing, can you? whole ideas. Okay, okay. So now we know how the T cells activate uh, or know what's dams and what BAMs and how do cell die, how the TLR bind the BAMs, activate the NFKB. We, we know the whole process of yani, the molecular process, yani, the, the, the binding on the receptor, the signaling pathway. So what's happened generally? How, how does bacteria invade? How does it enter? What, what's the order of these things before the whole molecular signaling pathway happen? So normally, uh, I won't explain, I won't explain it here. Okay, normally this is our body, this is us, and here we have our skin. One, the bacteria wants to invade. So we have the bacteria wants to enter. First, it faces the skin. The skin itself is the first line of defense, okay? With the secretions, because we in the skin have uh, sweat, we have many glands, oily glands, uh, also, we have some bacteria live on the skin that kill other bacteria. So the skin and the secretions on the skin are the first line of defense. So when the bacteria wants to invade our body, it go on the skin, and the skin usually kills it. So because it's the first line of defense, if this bacteria actually invade and penetrate the skin and enter to our blood or into to our body, the innate immunity will start. And we will talk what's the uh, difference between innate and adaptive immunity. You usually know it from high school, but then we will talk about it you know, later. But now, once it enters, the innate immunity activated. And the innate immunity are neutrophils, macrophages, and many other things mentioned in the slide. I will go over it. They are three things, okay? And they they are very general. They, they kill any type of bacteria. I mean, if the bacteria is, is bacteria or virus or anything, they don't care. This is an enemy and I want to kill it. So once it enters, it goes and kills them. Okay. Imagine this bacteria is way much stronger than this innate immunity and it actually skips it. Now our body develop an immunity or immune cells that are specific to this type of pathogen. Oh, this is this bacteria that it's dangerous. I will develop uh, uh, an immune cell that kills this bacteria specifically. And that's the role of adaptive immunity, which is T and B cells. They go and kill it. So now we have three lines of defense. The first line is the skin and its secretions. The second line is the innate immunity, which is not specific. They kill everything. But they are not that strong because they kill everything anyway. How will they be strong? If, our, if the bacteria skip them, they go to into the third type of defense, which is the adaptive immunity, which is the strongest and kill the specific bacteria. So let's go here. The immune system protects our body against infection with layered defenses. We said it's three layers. The first line of defense or the first layer is the physical barrier. And the physical barrier is the skin and membrane secretions, sweat or whatever secretions we have. They prevent microbes and viruses from entering our body. Okay, now imagine the, the microbe went to the skin, but it actually penetrates. If the, uh, the pathogen breaches these barriers and enter, the innate immunity will start. And the innate immunity is strong. It's not that strong, but strong that it, it is have, you know, it's not specific that can kill anything. So the innate immunity begin and it's not specific. And the innate immunity, it triggers when a microbe enter or whatever. And as we said, the innate immunity is the three things. The innate immunity cause inflammation, which is, you know, it brings more white blood cells to kill, which is inflammation. Also, it's complement system. We'll talk about it now. And recruiting of phagocytes, which is more white blood cells that phagocytes. You know what phagocytes mean by now, which is neutrophils and macrophages. So now the innate immunity uh, is the second line. Uh, it has inflammation complement system and the recruitment of phagocytes. Imagine these microbes actually invade this innate immunity. It will face the third line of defense, which is the strongest, which is the adaptive immunity system. Okay, the adaptive immunity system is activated by the innate because the innate yani, lost 
so, so the inmate يعني, wants uh, someone to help him فزعة, يعني. so the adaptive immunity is the فزعة of the uh, the adaptive immunity is the فزعة of innate immunity it comes and it's specific and it's T and B cells and kill the specific pathogen is it clear? okay okay so now as I said the innate immunity cause three things, inflammation and the recruitment of phagocytes, which are the, yani, something I guess you know by now. Inflammation, white blood cells come. Recruitment of phagocytes, yani, it's cause neutrophils and macrophages to come. But we have complement system. What the hell is complement system? And to be honest, I don't know why you have complement system in first year. The first time I knew about complement system, it was in POD. Because last year, yani, we were taught by Dr. Peter and we didn't have a complement system, but you know, we have complement system here. Complement pathway is actually very, very, very complicated, and it has many, many specific things. But here, Dr. Abdul Jabbar wants you to know like four or five info. They are just three call, so you don't know, you don't need to know the whole complement system pathway. Just follow what I will say, and yani, خلص, that's it. Don't know the whole complement system, because if you went to YouTube or anything, Explain the complement system. It's a very complicated thing. So just know what Dr. Abdul Jabbar wants you to want to know. So complement system is actually, yani generally, it's like proteins or enzymes. Let's say enzymes that are activated by being cut into half. Like we have these enzymes called complement one, complement two, complement three, complement like this. Complement one is like this. This is complement one. If we cut it in half. We will have complement 1A and complement 1B. This is the active forms of complement. Okay, now this complement B go and cut complement 2 into complement 2A, complement 2B. And this complement 2B usually B are the one that you know, kill or cut. And the, the cycle continue. They cut, 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 till we reach to something specific something, and that specific something cause the kill of the uh, microbes, okay? So now let's start with the pathway, but generally, very generally. We start with complement one, it go and cut complement two into complement, it actually doesn't start like this, but just you know, bear with me. Complement two and the A and B. Now complement two B go and cut more and more till we reach, that's way much uh, more uh, complicated than this, but just know what I'm saying. Till we reach to something called complement 3B and complement 3A. Okay. Now this complement 3B, now now we have complement 3A, has it's gone. We don't want it now. We want it later, but we don't want it now. Complement 3B go and cut more and more till we reach to complement 5B and complement 5A. Now also complement 5A, we don't want it now. Just ignore it. And now complement 5B go to the to the microbe let's say this is a bacteria complement 5b go and bind to this bacteria and when it binds to this bacteria it it, it summon all the other comp, comp, uh, complements complement 6 complement 7 complement 8 they all go to this bacteria they open it so now we have an opening in this bacteria and everything inside the bacteria gets out and the bacteria die okay this is generally the complement system okay what you need to focus on we need to focus on that the complement system first when it starts, like complement uh, one, the activated complement two, complements are floatings, okay? It needs to bind to a specific things to start its action. These things are one of those three, antibody antigen, carbohydrates, or pathogenic surface. Pathogenic surface, it means they go and bind to the bacteria. This bacteria complements one, binds to it and start doing its action. Carbohydrates, it go to bind the, to a carbohydrate of this bacteria or antibody antigen. It's like an antigen bind to this bacteria. Then the complement starts working on it. It's way much uh, complicated than this, but just know this. Complement starts on three things. Antibody antigen, carbohydrates, or pathogenic surface. Once it starts, it starts cutting, 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 cutting till we reach to, three, uh, to C3B, C3A. So now this is our first station. We start cut, cut, cut till we reach to C3A and C3B. We ignore C3A for uh, at the moment. And C3B start the, the second station, which is cut, 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 cut till we reach to C5A and C5B. 
We ignore C5A at the moment. C5B go and binds to the microbe and cause all the other C, C6, C7, C8, to go and bind to this uh, bacteria, open it, and cause everything inside it to go out and kills it. So that's the whole gimmick of the complement system. Okay, so now how the complement protein, C3, C2, whatever, start to cut themselves, okay? They start to cut, 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 till we reach to C3B and C3A. C3B continue till we have C5B, C5A. C5B binds and bring all, all his team, C6, C7, C8, and attack the microbe. This, this whole thing, C5, C6, C7, C8, the whole thing that come to kill is called membrane attack complex because they attack the membrane of the uh, microbe. So they call membrane attack complex, which is MAC. Okay, so C6, C7, C8, and these things are summoned by C5B to kill the microbe, and they are called MAC. Okay, and the components of the bacteria come out and they die. Now we said we ignored two things, C3, C3A and C5A. What, what's the function of these things, C3A and C5A? Anything A is anaphylactic. Anaphylactic means it brings more white blood cells, not, not complement cells, no, white blood cells like neutrophils, macrophages, they summon the other helper team. So now we have the CB, C3B, C5B. It's either they cut or bind to the membrane and bring the others, the other Cs. But the CA, which is specifically not all As, it's just the C3A and C5A. They are anaphylactic, so they bring all other white blood cells, neutrophils, dendritic cells, and whatever, and they kill. One last thing you need to know that the C3B is function, yeah, it cuts the other things, but it has another function, which is opsonin. What does that mean? Opsonin is something like, this is the cell. Opsonin go and bind to the cell. And once it binds, it doesn't do anything. It just shouts. Shout to who? To the phagocytes that, hey, I am here. Hey, I am here. So the white blood cells, which is the neutrophils, go and phagocyte the whole thing. So it's just yani, someone who goes, oh, oh there is a bacteria here, and it binds to it, and they call the phagocytes to come and eat them. That's the opsonin, and this is the function of C3B other than cutting. Is it clear? Everything summarized on the slide. I know it's way much chaotic, but everything you need to memorize is just from the slide. So if I were you, I will understand the thing, then just memorize what's here, and that's it. Okay, so one last time. Uh, let's see what you need to memorize. We said that the complement system go and start from three things. You need to memorize these three things, antibody antigen, carbohydrates, or pathogenic surface. The complement system start to cut itself till we reach to something called C3B, C3A. You don't need any number, any other numbers. Just know, complement system cut itself till we reach to C3B and C3A. C3A, let's ignore it now. C3B go and cut till we reach to C5B, C5A. Let's ignore C5A now. C5B go and binds to the bacteria and cause the MAC, the membrane attack complex, which is C6, C7, C8, to come and kill this bacteria. They open it and cause anything inside it to get out. Okay, now what we ignored, C3A and C5A. What are they? They are anaphylactic. They cause the summoning of other white blood cells like neutrophils, macrophages, and whatever. And last thing that C3B function as opsonin, which is bind on the microbe and say, hey, I am here. So the phagocytes came, uh, come and uh, phagocyted and kill it. Last time, is it clear? Is that so much important? Yani in POD, we got like four questions from here. And literally they were, three of them, they were from these concepts, which is, C3A, what's its function? Anaphylactic. Which of the following function as an opsonin? C3B. Uh, the complement system, uh, yani summoning MAC. Which of the following uh, complement is the one that summon MAC? C5B. And there was another uh, question for the whole complex pathway, but anyway, we don't need to know it. So now, the second checkpoint, we still have two more things, two more concepts, and yani, we finish inflammation one. So, clear, right? What's the time? Okay. Okay. So now we have, as we said, two types of immunity, innate and adaptive immunity. Innate immunity is, yani, uh, 
I'm sure you know now about them, so I won't go that deep. It's all in this table. It's old. It's once you, you are born, it's innately there. It's there. You don't need to develop it or have vaccines to increase its power. No, no. It's just there and there. That's it. So the innate immunity is old, present at birth. There is no stimulation required. So yeah, there is no need for a vaccine to increase its power. No, no, it's just there. Uh, it has very sp uh, minimal specificity. So it's against everything, micro, virus, everything. It works against it. The response is very fast within minutes. Just once the bacteria invade the skin, innate immunity uh, gets activated and kill the bacteria. There is no change in quantity or uh, quality. Uh, there is no memory cells. So yani, every single time they in the bacteria entered, they attack it as a new thing. They don't know, know, oh, we had this bacteria one month ago. No, no, they don't know that. There is no memory cells. And uh, there is no, it, it, yani, the soluble factor are lysosomes and these things. And it's phagocytes, yani, neutrophils, macrophages. We will talk about them now. But yani, it has phagocytic cells. They go and phagocytose and that's it. They don't actually kill it. They phagocytose it. There are other things that kill it, like natural killer cells. We will talk about them later. The adaptive immunity evolves. Yani, once you have an infection and you, you get your medication and خلص, it resolves, it will evolve. Yani, you will have a stronger adaptive immunity. Once you get the disease, you will have a stronger immunity. So it's evolved in early uh, vertebras. It uh, developed throughout lives. Uh, it is required. Uh, it is. Ha it has high specificity. So it's specific to this microbe. It's specific to this virus. Okay, and uh, it has something called self non self discrimination. You will have it with Dr. Shawaf and one of my friends, I guess Abdurrahman. He will explain it to you tomorrow the self and non-self discrimination, very important thing, and uh, develops over days. So it's it's not within minutes, no, it needs times till it gets activated and uh, improved by uh, previous exposure. There is memory cells. So there are some cells that stay from this uh, adaptive immunity that if you get an, this infection next month, they will say, oh, we had this infection next month. We know how to kill it. And they go and kill it. And it has antibodies, cytokines, T cell, B cells. You should know all of this slide from before, because you know, I remember having it before HLS somewhere, at least in high school. So now we talked about the innate immunity that it has phagocytic cells. What are these phagocytic cells? So we said innate leukocytes, which is the innate immunity white blood cells, are phagocytes. They go and phagocytose the thing and then kill it after they phagocytose it. And these are the neutrophils, macrophages, dendritic cells. I'm pretty sure Dr. Rehan explained these things. Phagocytes identify the pathogen, attack them, uh, and engulf them. We'll talk about how phagocytosis occur, but let's talk about the cells at the beginning. So uh, as we said, the pathogens may be coated with opsonins, which are C3B and IgG, which are calling for phagocytosis. They say, hey, we are here, phagocytose us to kill this microbe. So uh, that's it. Let's talk about the specific cells of the innate immunity. We have two types of cells, the phagocytes and non-phagocytes. The phagocytes, they go and phagocytose, then kill. The non-phagocytes, they go and kill directly, okay? So the phagocytosis uh, cells are neutrophils, macrophages, and dendritic cells. The non-phagocytosis cells are NK, eosinophils, and mast cells. We will talk about them later. Let's start with the phagocytosis cell. What is phagocytosis first? I want to skip, skip, skip to phagocytosis. What is phagocytosis? We have the pathogen coming. These cells go and increase their membrane to surround this pathogen like this. They surround it and then they, they engulf it into a membrane. This is called endosome. So now this bacteria is inside the cell by an endosome. Then they fuse with a lysosome. And this lysosome releases its proteins and degrade it. And then it gets released out. So this is phag uh, phagocytosis. It's all in here. First, the bacteria gets engulfed into a membrane by the neutrophils or macrophages. Then it is in, in an endosome. This endosome or phagosome, let's say, phagosome. It's uh, the phagosome fused with the lysosome. Lysosome release uh, enzymes to degrade the bacteria. Then the bacteria stuff get released out. Macrophages are the best, most efficient phagocytes 
So the best phagocytosis happen in macrophage. This can be an MCQ. And these things relate to macrophage. They are more, they have more material, larger, and they live longer. So now let's get back to the type of the cells. First, we have neutrophils. Neutrophils, you took it, I'm pretty sure, with Dr. Raihan, are these, okay? This, the ones here, okay? They have body, they have any yani, polymorphic nucleus, which means it is, has a nucleus that has many parts. Look here, nucleus number one, two, three, four, five. So once you have a cell with many nucleus, these are neutrophils or BMN, which is polymorphic nucleus. These recognized BAMPs, binds to it, ingest it, cause phagocytosis, and after it binds, yani after it is inside, ROS, reactive uh, oxygen species, kill this bacteria or uh, pathogen and release it out. So that's first, neutrophils, these here. The second one is macrophages. They are a killer, and they are the best, as we said. They are, they have monocytes, which is like this. They, so they have one uh, nucleus only, and they go and uh, cause phagocytosis, kill by reactive oxygen species. And they have something called ABC, antigen presenting uh, cells, which you'll to, uh, took it uh, tomorrow with uh, one of my friends. Okay, so they present an antigen. You, you will know everything tomorrow, inshallah. Then we have something called dendritic cells. And dendritic cells, the gimmick of it, they are like macrophage. Uh, they link the innate immunity with adaptive immunity. So they are, cells that go, uh, I would explain if, uh, briefly what's uh, antigen presenting cells mean. Didn't we say that bacteria has a BAM? So macrophage go and kills this bacteria, phagocytosis, kill it, then take this BAM and put it on its surface. Okay, the same thing with dendritic cells. Dendritic cells do this more. Now dendritic cells go and kill this bacteria and then put its antigen on its head. Then it go to one of the uh, adaptive immunity, T cells, B cells, tell them, hey, see, I have this bacterial antigen, which is pathogenic. Can you kill them? And it's give it to T cell or B cells activating them. So now we know that dendritic cells is actually linking the innate immunity, which is the macrophages, the bacteria, and these things into the adaptive immunity, which is B cells and T cells. So now you know what's antigen presenting means. You, you kill the bacteria, take its antigen, and give it to another cell to activate it. And who is the best acti uh, antigen presenter is dendritic cells. They go, take the antigen from the bacteria, put it on its head, give it to the T cells and B cells, tell them, hey, I have this pathogen for a bacteria which is dangerous. Can you help me and kill it? And it gets activated and T cells, B cells go and kill. Which means that the dendritic cells are the bridge between the macrophage, uh, between the innate immunity and uh, Adaptive immunity. We had this question in POD actually. What, which type of cell is the bridging or something like this? So, is it clear? The three type of phagocytes. Okay. Now, neutrophils, as we said, they are the most common. I mean, the majority of the white blood cells is actually neutrophils. So 60 to 70% of white blood cells is actually a neutrophil. And this can be a, an MCQ. Which of the following is the most common white blood cells? And it is neutrophil. So neutrophils are the most common white blood cells. Uh, macrophage or monocytes are actually common, but it's not that much. It's just 2 to 6%, but they are the best phagocytosis cells. So the most common, neutrophils. The best phagocytosis, macrophage. The link between adaptive and innate dendritic cells. So now, how does macrophage develop? We have two types of macrophage. Okay, uh, we finished this part. Okay, I just said these things, so we are here. Okay, to orient you more. So now we have two types of macrophage: macrophage that come from the blood, and macrophage which is inside the cell. So now we have the macrophage that flow in the blood. It goes everywhere with the blood, and we have macrophage that it's fixed on its place. Like it's on the epithelium. It's on the GI here, okay? It's fixed to it, okay? We have two types of macrophage, the fixed one and the blood moving one. Let's talk first about the blood moving one. The one that's blue uh, move in the blood, it's yani, actually first in the first life, yani, at the beginning of its development, it comes from something called monocyte. 
okay? Monocytes derived from blood, from bone marrow, these monocytes that are in bone marrow in the blood uh, get then يعني, mature and became macrophages and it invades cells and these things. You, you will have it with Dr. Raihan in details. So I'm just talking about the يعني, types generally. You have monocytes in blood. Once it enters into the cell, it became developed into a whole macrophage. And this macrophage came from a monocyte that move everywhere with the blood. So this macrophage can move everywhere. And this, the first type, the monocyte derived macrophage. They come from where? From a monocyte. And monocyte are actually where? From the bone marrow. So in the bone marrow, we have monocytes. These monocytes develop and they become macrophages. So now we have the first type, monocyte derived macrophages are macrophages which are made from monocytes in bone marrow and their lifespan is too low that it's die with, within days. So I mean, they do their action fastly and they die. The other type are the tissue resident macrophages. They are fixed into specific tissue. They are in the GI. They are in the, uh, let's say, epithelium because they are fixed there. So we have the epithelium here and we have this macrophage. Plus it's on it and it can't move. So it is there. Once there is a bacteria uh, passed from it, it kills it, but it can't move. It can't go from GI into the heart, then into the brain. Because it's fixed there. This is the macrophage of the brain. This is the macrophage of the heart because they are fixed, okay? From where they develop? From two things, not monocyte. It's not related to monocyte because it's not in the blood. It is from two things, from fetal liver and from uh, yolk sac. So it's things that when you are young, develop these fixed macrophage that stay in one place and kill the bacteria at that one place. They can't help in anything else. They are just fixed there. And their life is very long, like it's years. Because yes. they are fixed. They are the macrophage of that place. We don't need to change them every single day. We need them to stay there for years. So the macrophage the, that are fixed there called tissue resident macrophages, okay? And they are made and kept within the tissue with a very, very long life span, like years, okay? And their origin is yolk sac and liver monocytes not the blood bone marrow monocyte, okay? So if he asks you in the MCQ, which of the following uh, macrophage is made within the liver monocytes, don't say, oh, monocytes, I will choose monocyte derived macrophage. No, the monocyte derived macrophage are monocytes from the bone marrow. We are talking about liver monocytes. Liver monocytes make the fixed uh, tissue resident macrophages and also the yolk sac monocytes. So please don't let the word monocyte distract you. If he said which of the following macrophages is made from monocytes and he shut up, then you okay, this is monocyte derived macrophage. It's the monocyte from bone marrow. But if he said which of the following is made from liver monocytes or, wall, uh, or yolk sac monocytes, this is not the monocyte in the bone marrow. This is the monocyte in liver and yolk sac. So it makes a tissue resident macrophage which has a very long lifespan. Is it clear? Okay. We already explained the phagocytosis. Uh, here we have the mechanism of phagocytosis, which is very important because I want to explain something else since we took about the tissue resident macrophage. We talked about the tissue resident macrophage and how it does, uh, how is it fixed to a specific place, okay? so. If it's, if it's in the blood, it's called monocyte. We said that. And macrophages. But if it go to a specific place and it lives there, I need the macrophage of the brain, we can't call them macrophage because as we know that's the macrophage of the brain. We need to have a specific names for these and you need to memorize them. First one is microglia. These are the macrophage in the brain. So we don't call the macrophage in the brain macrophage. We call them microglia, okay? In the spleen, splenic macrophage, intestinal macrophage, uh, bone marrow macrophage. In the liver, we call them Kupfer cell. Kupfer cell are the macrophage in the liver. In the eye, we have intraocular macrophage. You need to memorize them, okay? Uh, everything in this slide, the names, you need to know them, especially macroglia and Kupfer. Kupfer, we had it last year in HLS. It was a question. Macroglia, we had it this year in Neuro. We had which, which uh, type of immune cells are in the brain, and it was microglia. Okay, you need to memorize these things.
Okay, now we said phagocytosis, it, this is the cell. No, this is the microbe, sorry. This is the microbe. And this is the cell. The cell go and phagocytose this microbe and enter it to a lysosome. We said once the bacteria enter a lysosome, the lysosome release enzymes and kill it. What are these enzymes? Do they have types? Yes. We have, there is two types of lysosomal degradation. The lysosome degrade this microbe. How? We have two types. The first one, lysosomal hydrolases. These are a specific proteins or enzymes for a specific parts of bacteria. So after entry of bacteria into the lysosome, acid hydrolases enzymes, acid hydrolases enzymes are nucleases, proteases, glycodiases, lipases. Lipases kill the lipids, remove it. The nucleases kill the, uh, the nucleus. So they are specific proteins to specific parts of the bacteria. Uh, uh, degrade these specific parts and then kill the bacteria. So first we have lysosomal hydrolases, which are the specific proteins that kill the bacteria. And they called acid hydrolases. What does acid mean here? That they need an acidic BH to our acidic environment to work and function well. So all of these enzymes need acidic environment, which is BH equal to five. Thus, uh, we have uh, something called ATBH bump. It always causes a hydrogen to go inside. So we maintain a BH, which is five, to maintain the function of these proteins, nucleases, proteases, and these things. These proteins go and kill the uh, bacteria, how they degrade specific parts. So nucleases degrade the nucleus, proteases degrade the protein, okay? And it has uh, it needs a specific pH, which is pH five. That's why we need an H bump, cause hydrogen to go inside all the time. Is it clear? I guess it's clear. Yes. Okay. Let's continue. The other type is lysosomal uh, phagosomal sorry, phagosomal NADBH oxidase. It is an enzyme that causes the formation of an ROS. ROS are reactive oxygen species that go and kill the bacteria. You, you saw here in lysosomal hydrolysis, they go and kill the nuclear membrane. They kill the protein. They kill the lipase. No, no. Here we have ROS that go and kill the bacteria directly. Look here. It, it is split it in half and خلص, kill it. يعني, it's very vicious. So the other type, we said it's phagosomal NADH oxidase, which is an ROS, reactive oxygen species, that co go and kill the bacteria. Now we have a pathway, and I know you hate small pathways, so please memorize it like your name. So how do we develop these ROS, the reactive oxygen species? We need to develop them into to kill the bacteria. How do we develop these ROS inside the lysosome? First, we have an enzyme called NADBH oxidase. NADBH oxidase converts O2 into superoxide, which is O2 like this, okay? So first, NADBH oxidase take an oxygen and convert it into superoxide. Superoxide is an ROS, but it's not enough to kill. It, again, it's not that strong. We need to convert ROS, uh, the oxygen, this superoxide, once more. So we have something called superoxide dismutase, the SOD enzyme. Superoxide dismutase go and convert superoxide into something called hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2. So now we have O2 at the beginning. NADBH oxidase developed into O2 minus, which is superoxide. Then we have SOD, superoxide dismutase, converted into H2O2. Is it enough? No. H2O2 now gets converted into something called HOCl, which is high. Uh, hydrochloros or something like this. So it, uh, hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, gets converted into HOCl, which is hydrochloros. And uh, this happened by an enzyme called myloperoxidase. Peroxidase. So now the enzyme myloperoxidase converts H2O2 into HOCl. Now HOCl go and kill the bacteria. And it's very strong that it's the most potent ROS that kills bacteria, okay? HOCl. We have another thing that H2O2 gets converted by the help of iron into OH, OH minus, uh, sorry, OH positive. And OH positive is also strong and potent, but no, the HOCl is stronger and both of them 
go and kill the bacteria. This process, the whole thing called respiratory burst. Okay, respiratory burst cause you to have some heat. So that's why after an infection, you feel warm. It's because the respiratory burst and increased blood supply to this area. And my friend will explain it later why there's increased blood supply in these things. So now, is this clear? The pathway or you need me to repeat it? Okay. okay. Honestly, I want to repeat it. We took so much time. Okay, uh, checkpoint. As we said, everything is clear. We explained this thing. We still have one, two, one, two slides. Okay, and then we have the question and we finish. Okay, now we said that we have two types of cells in the innate immunity. First are phagocytes that go and cause phagocytosis. Then the lysosome go and degrade it. And we have the non-phagocytes. They don't do phagocytosis. They go and kill directly. Go to the microbe, kill it, go. Very simple. These are the non-phagocytic leukocytes. And the first one is NK cell or natural killer cells. I like natural killer cells because, because they, they are so simple in, in their uh, mechanism of action. So NK cells simply go to the microbe, stab it, like literally stab it, make an opening in it. And to stab it, it needs its knife and the knife called perforin. Perforin is the knife on, of the NK cell, it's stab. Now, after we stab, we, we, we give, uh, yani we, uh, yani after it stab the microbe, it releases an enzymes inside the microbe to kill the microbe. And these enzymes called the gray enzymes, gray enzymes uh, released into the microbe and it completely kills it, okay? So it's literally like this. We have the, uh, the bacteria and we have natural killer cells. Natural killer cells go and stab the bacteria. Now we have an opening inside the bacteria. Do we wait for things to get out? No, natural killer cells want to finish their work as early as possible. First, they stab by the knife, which is perforin. Then they release their heat, or let's say the, the, their power, you know, the, the enzymes that kill the bacteria, which are gray enzymes. Gray enzymes get inside and kill the bacteria. Okay, that's natural killer cells simply. Natural killer cells are actually strong and very vicious, but actually, and we have a way to develop natural killer cells into a more potent, more strong way. We have something released by macrophages and other immune cells. You will take it uh, with my friend, Diani, a little bit, something called chemical mediators, and by Dr. Rayhan, I guess. Things called interleukins, like interleukin one, two, three, four, things like this. Interleuk interleukin two, if interleukin two gets released, it go into natural killer cells and evolve it. It make it a, a very strong natural killer cells and it's called LAC, LAC cells, which is lymphokine activated killer. Okay, lymphokine activated killer, LAC. What are LAC? They are natural killer cells activated by interleukin two and something called interferon. So we have natural killer cells that go stabbed by berfarin and release their power, which is gray enzymes to kill the bacteria. Natural killer cells, we can make them way much stronger by something called interleukin-2. Interleukin-2, go to natural killer cells and interferon, by the way, we said that. Interleukin-2 and interferon, go to natural killer cells, evolve it to make it lack. Lymphokine activated the something. And this lack go and kill the bacteria even more viciously. So that's natural killer cells. The other type is xenophils. Xenophils, yani, they are, they are good. They are non-phagocytic. They kill, but yani, not in all cases, only in two cases. Xenophils uh, work in allergic reactions when you have allergy. And if you have worm or parasites, okay, they punch a hole in them. It's similar to natural killer cells. You have the bacteria, but no, now it's not bacteria. We said it is par uh, parasite, which is tophiliate. Okay, uh, isinophil go and bunch a hole inside it, but it doesn't release anything. It waits for the things inside the parasite to get out. So that's the function of isinophil. Isinophils in allergic reaction or worms or parasites, how they bunch a hole. We have basophils, but he didn't mention them in the lecture, so I won't mention them. Uh, you will have them by Dr. Uh, Rehan, I guess. And you have mast cell. Mast cell are, yani, 
uh, release histamine, cause uh, uh, inflammation. They they are helper. They don't actually any yani, vicious in killing. No, no. Look, they present in lining of body surface, and yani it's on the surface of the epithelium, such as skin, mouth, nose, uh, lung mucosa, which is the epithelium, digestive tract. They release histamine and heparin and assist wound healing. Uh, and these chemicals increase blood flow, cause vasodilation, allow components of immunity. So mast cells are not actually killers. They are helpers in the inflammation. Yani they release histamine and heparin. And you will take by my friend that histamine and heparin are important for wound healing. And uh, they increase blood flow and cause vasodilation of the blood vessels. So more blood can come. So more white blood cells can come. So they are helper. They are not killer. Okay. So is it clear? Okay, here we finish inflammation one mostly, and I will just give you a brief uh, introduction into inflammation. And my friend, Muhammad Haddad, he will explain the whole thing of inflammation. And uh, I guess Yani, you will have fun time in it because inflammation is really good and uh, he is actually a really good tutor. So let's start. Inflammation is Yani when you have a microbe that enter into, uh, enters into your body and Yani, you know, Neutrophils recognize it, it phagocytose, then macrophages, phagocytoses, it release cytokines and chemical mediators and these things. So we have a lot of white blood cells coming to this area. This is inflammation. Okay. Inflammation is an immune response that causes many white blood cells to come to kill this bacteria or this pathogen or even dams. But no, that's wrong because dams are not causing any inflammation. Uh, not dams, sorry. Dams actually cause inflammation. I mean, uh, not in apoptosis. So inflammation is in necrosis, not in apoptosis. I guess I put it in one of my question. So inflammation causes all white blood cells or whatever immune defense to come to kill this pathogen in dumps and bumps and in necrosis only. Okay, so we have it in bumps and we have it in dumps in necrosis only. We don't have it in dumps of uh, apoptosis because there is no dumps in apoptosis in the first place okay so please if he gave you an mcq uh, which of the following is not uh, doesn't uh, induce an immune response please put apoptosis because there is no dumps okay that's the first thing so inflammation is the initial response of the body to infection or trauma uh, we have many types of tissue injury like a trauma an infection a pathogen a virus a radiation uh, chemical irritation, many things that cause the cell to die and release its dumps and cause an inflammation or a pathogen enter with its bumps and uh, cause also an inflammation. Inflammation, when it happens, it causes many, many things, okay? Many cellular things, okay? Like vasodilation, increased blood flow, penetration of the blood vessels, sometimes penetration of uh, blood brain barrier. But that's cellular things my friend will taught you. Here, I'm going to tell you about things that inflammation cause into your body from outside, okay? Yani macroscopically, let's say, okay? And they are in Latin words. So first we have rubber, which is redness. You will find that your hand is actually red, okay? Which is rubber, redness, okay? Why is it red? Because of increase in uh, blood flow because of vasodilation, my friend will explain it. We have color color, which is heat. And we actually said why there is heat, because we have the, uh, the th to be honest, I forgot its name. It's the, yes, here, the respiratory burst. This cause heat, the color, okay, cause color, which is heat, the supra, the respiratory burst, and actually the increased blood flow, okay? The third thing is tumor. Tumor is not tumor. No, no, this is a Latin word. And it means a swelling. So we have a swelling of the area because actually we have increased blood flow and uh, edema and many proteins get out and in these things. And then we have dollar, which is pain. And that's because we irritate the nerve in, yani, around the thing. Because it gets irritated, uh, we will have the dollar, which is pain. And finally, we have function legia, which is the loss of function. Because if your hand gets inflamed severely and yani, there's edema, and there is pain, there is heat. You can't actually function normally. So we have punctualitia, which is the loss of function. And that's it for inflammation. Briefly, it causes white blood cells and many other things to come. It doesn't happen in apoptosis. 
and it caused these five cardinal signs. There is more, but yani, in his lecture, there's five. Ruber, color, tumor, dolor, function, lydia. Memorize the Latin one because he can ask about them. Do you have any question? Yes. Um, okay, uh, I have a question. Both uh, interleukin and uh, one and pumps, they both, and like these both are helping in inflammation, right? So interleukins right. get released by the yes. bacteria uh, to attract the That's RBCs. By bacteria. No, but like when by like there's an inflammation, by microphages? Oh, okay. okay. And then the pumps? By bacteria is... eat, then macrophage eat them, and then it mm -hmm. releases chemokines, isotokines, which are interleukin one, two, three, and these things, mm -hmm. to bring more. So macrophage yeah. release them. So my microphages... explain it. Uh, okay. So That's right. microphages. Okay. Um, I yeah, think you're lagging. What? I think you're lagging, or it's I'm lagging. J just ask it. What, what do you want? Uh, I asked. So, like, I just wanted to know, like, the pumps and like interleukins both play part in, you know, um recognizing the, the bacteria yeah yeah mm. bumps come with the bacteria so this bacteria it has bumps mm -hmm. our body recognizes uh, bumps so macrophage go and eat this bacteria and then kill it and then release interleukin and these things to bring more white blood cells uh -huh. so okay. both bumps and interleukin play a role but bump is actually the thing that our body recognizes, and interleukin is the thing that our body releases to call other white blood cells Okay, okay, yes. Alongside S3B, right? Uh, no, S S3B is calling for phagocytosis. Yes, yes. But it's alongside with S3, uh, C3A and C5A. They also call uh -huh. another uh, white blood cells. Yeah. Yani everything, like, I mean, they both, uh, yes. everything call for inflammation in its own way. Bums call for macrophages to eat. Yani macrophages actually eat them. Macrophages increase, uh, release interleukins and these things to call for other cells. C3B call for phagocytosis. And C3A and C5A call many other white blood cells randomly to just come and uh, help. And uh, at the end of inflammation too, there is part called chemical mediators. We have these things there, I guess. Yep, thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, let's go to the questions. So. Oh, okay. I, remove, I forgot to remove the answer. So, okay. Which of the following complements serve as an opsonin? Opsonin means yani, it goes and call for phagocytosis. Which one? Yes, it is B, which is C3B. Which of the following is uh, similar to the macrophage, but in the brain? Yani, it's asking what's the macrophages in the brain, what we call it. Also B, microglia. Okay, let's get down. Okay. Oh, this is bad. Okay, we will have the answer no matter what. The leukocyte that serves as the defense mechanism against parasites, we said that it's eosinophil. Eosinophils go and punch a hole and it's only in parasites. What, what's other than parasites? That's the question. We have two things, parasites and other thing. No, it's actually eosinophil, yeah, let's see. Yes, uh, allergic reaction and viruses. And finally, we have the cell surface receptor that detects dumps. We said that dumps are detected by NLR, which is not like receptor, not CLR, not TLR. It is not like receptor. So dumps are recognized by not like receptors. Uh, bumps are recognized by TLR. So everything clear? Okay, so if you have any question, this is my number, this is my email. I prefer to call me by any, my number on WhatsApp. In the email, I barely respond there. So best of luck and continue with Muhammad Haddad in part two. You will actually have fun. Inflammation process is very fun and he is actually very good in explaining. So that's it for me. Thank you, Samhar. Do you guys want to break or should I start immediately? Uh, I just want to... Close the.
Rick, okay, so we'll come back at four at uh, eleven forty five. Okay, so 11.45, we'll start. Okay, so uh, I'm Mohamed Haddad. I'm a second year student. I'm going to be teaching inflammation and healing, the second part. Uh, proceed quickly. If you have any questions you are during the whole, the, the session, stop me. If you feel like I'm going quickly, tell me to slow down. If you feel like I'm going slowly, tell me to speed. Okay, so let's start. First of all, what's inflammation? Before we even do that, uh, reply in the chat. Do you think inflammation is a good thing or a bad thing? A good response or a bad response in our body? Okay, the answer is it depends. So it, it is good, but it can turn to become chronic and it can become bad. So it can cause harmful effects to our body. So. Uh, inflammation is, is the tissue's response to our body's response to any injury. So whether it's bacterial, whether it's trauma, whatever, whatever it is. And inflammation consists of two parts. There's the vascular part, so the blood vessels, etc. And there, there's the cellular component. So the white blood cells, the neutrophils, blah, 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 blah. And uh, all of this process is controlled by chemical mediators. So cytokines, all the stuff. We'll get to it in the end of the lecture. And... Uh, so all of it happens so that we can get rid of whatever damage that is, whatever is causing this response. So whether it's a bacteria invading, so neutrophils will go, blood what, what, uh, blood vessels will dilate, blood uh, blood flow will increase, and uh, neutrophils and white vessels will go to the damaged site, get rid of the bacteria, resolve it, uh, repair the, the damaged tissue, etc. So that's the whole point of inflammation, but. A lot of things can happen that will cause it to become harmful to our body. So, for example, if there is uh, a hypersensitivity reaction, so if there's an allergy. So, for example, if someone is allergic to peanut butter, for example, an inflammation will happen, but it's not a good response because it's not harmful to our body. It's just our body thinks it's harmful to us because of something, because of uh, these cells recognizing Blah, 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 doesn't matter. Press, like uh, eosinophils are involved with it. You'll get, you'll take more about this next year in POD. But uh, yeah, so one of the harmful stuff is hypersensitivity. Another thing is that if if the uh, if the agent that's causing the inflammation, so the bacteria, or whatever, is persistent. So our body is trying to get rid of it, but it's staying, it's not going away. The, the inflammation will develop into chronic inflammation. So it's a long-term inflammation and it will start having negative effects on our body. And if this chronic inflammation happens, uh, our the, our uh, tissues will tend not to uh, like go back to the original, and, and they won't get like repaired, but they'll be will form scars. I'll get more into this later on. So there are three types of inflammation. Doctor Abdul Jabbar said not to focus on granulomatous inflammation, but I'll explain it. So there's acute inflammation, which is the normal inflammation. So if you have a bacterial infection, whatever, this is acute inflammation. It's a short duration, like usually. Uh, hours to half a day a day and uh, you'll have edema because of blood vessel dilation and etc and the main responders in acute inflammation are neutrophils and then you have chronic inflammation which develops if acute inflammation does not resolve and uh, this uh, the main responders in this uh, inflammation is macrophages and lymphocytes uh, and I'll get to why to uh, I'll get to why those are the two main responders and you'll have fibrosis and angiogenesis fibrosis is basically when uh, fibroblasts migrate to the area and deposit collagen, which result in scar formation. And angiogenesis is the formation of new blood vessels because of the extensive damage. Together, when those two happen together, it, it, uh, it forms something called granulation tissue. I'll get to what granulation tissue is at the end as well. And granulomatous inflammation is a special type of chronic inflammation. It's basically when the, the macrophages get activated into something called epithelioid cells, which is basically a group of macrophages that get clumped up together and become one big macrophage called giant multinucleated cell. It happens in diseases like tuberculosis or if there's a foreign object in your body. But Dr. Abdul Jabbar said, don't focus on this right now. So acute inflammation. Acute inflammation involves three important things. First of all, uh, when there's a stimulus, so when there's an infection, whatever, uh, the, the body will, will do three things. First of all, it will increase the blood flow, which will result in uh, redness 
and warmth because when your blood when your blood vessels in the super, in the superficial areas like in your skin get dilated the, your blood is warm we're warm blooded so you'll get uh, warmth and because red, blood is red so you'll get redness and then you'll have edema exudate I'll explain what exudate is and then you will have leukocyte migration. So uh, white blood cells, mainly neutrophils, will move to the area of inflammation by something called the chemokine. So uh, cells that are in the area of inflammation will release interleukin-8, which is a chemokine, which is a chemical that basically, uh, like when it's released, it calls other white blood cells to the area so it can deal with the problem. Okay, so edema and inflammation. Uh, and normally, not normally, when there is edema that's not an inflammation, it's usually transudate, which means that uh, it does not contain cells, it's just fluid. So normally in our body, in, in our vessels right now, there's hydrostatic pressure, which is press pressure inside the blood vessels that pushes, uh, that pushes uh, filtrate outside the body. So it pushes plasma, etc., outside the blood vessel. And then there is uh, plasma proteins inside the blood vessel, which cause the colloid osmotic pressure, which pulls the uh, fluid back into the cell. And normally those two are balanced, uh, which means that there will not be, not be edema. So if there is any, any, the, any abnormality in our body, for example, if there is congestive heart failure, if there is increased blood pressure, whatever, uh, there will be an uh, increase in hydrostatic pressure, which will cause the fluid leakage, which will cause edema. Or, for example, if there is a problem in the liver and your liver is not producing, uh, and your liver is not producing enough proteins, there can be a decrease in the decrease in colloid osmotic pressure. So there will be less proteins in the blood vessels. So they will pull less. Uh, they will pull less uh, fluid into the into back into the blood vessel that leaked. So both of this will cause edema, but this edema is called a transudate, which means that, uh, that there's no cells in it. So it's just plasma fluid. But in the case of inflammation, we will form exudate. Why, would, why do we form exudate? It's because the endothelial cells, wait, let me put out the pointer. Uh, here. The endothelial cells will separate because of a because of an interleukin that's released. They'll separate, so not only plasma fluid will go out of the blood vessels, but also cells, so white blood cells. So in inflammation, there is exudate, so that white blood cells can go out of the blood vessels and deal with the inflammation. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain exudate and exudate in another way. Let's imagine you're making orange juice, okay? So you're squeezing the orange juice, and you pour it into a cup without a filter. So if you don't have a filter, that means the blood vessels are open. So you'll have the, 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 the juice and the pulp. That means you'll have the plasma fluid and the cells. But if you use a filter, so it's, the cells are close to each other and there's only pressure on it, then you'll only have the juice with no pulp. That's a way I used, I used to memorize it in POD so I can understand it well. Okay, now to the fun stuff. Uh, when there's vasodilation, in, in, in inflammation, uh, there's increased blood, uh, blood uh, increased blood pressure and increased everything, so that we can drive more white blood cells to the area of inflammation. This is so that we could those blood cells, blood blood cells can deal with the inflammation itself. But it's not that simple. It's not they don't just go there and then go out. There is a process called uh, exophization, which is basically the leukocyte moving out of the blood vessels into the interstitium, so they can deal with it. This involves three steps. You have rolling. And then you have uh, margination, and then you have diapedesis. Rolling, uh, rolling, and each of them involves a specific uh, protein. So those there's there's two type two type of proteins on the cell. There is cellular Lewis and integrins. Those two are on the leukocyte itself, and on the and on the endothelium of the blood vessels. There's there are three uh, there are three proteins. There's P selectin, E selectin, and ICAM. Okay. So we said the first step is rolling. So imagine there's a blood vessel here, the leukocyte is moving in the blood vessels and there's chemokines being released from the area of inflammation. So when the chemokines, when the blood vessel, when the, when the leukocyte detects the chemokines, it knows it has to exit the blood vessel here. So it goes and starts rolling on the, uh, on the, on the, on the theme of the blood vessel. This rolling is mediated by three proteins. You have the cellular Lewis glycoprotein on the leukocyte itself, and then you have P-selectin and E-selectin, okay? So this is the first step, it's rolling. So the cell, the cell just goes, 
attaches to the endothelium and starts rolling towards the area of inflammation. So the, you have the cell, Lewis, it goes and first binds to P-selectin, and then it binds to, the, to another, to another E-selectin, and it's just rolled to, towards the area of inflammation. And then after, after it rolls closer to the area of inflammation, there's chemokines, which are released, and they, uh, act, they cause the ex expression of ICAM. ICAM is responsible for the adhesion and the, the margination of the, uh, the leukocyte. So first of all, you have the rolling process, and then after rolling, the, the white blood cell uh, needs to go closer into the uh, endothelium so it can go out. This is known, known as margination. So you can see it right here. And this is mediated by uh, integrins and ICAMs. And now, people might ask questions. You know, why doesn't the, why isn't this, the, the 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 leukocyte immediately go into margination? Why doesn't it, why does it do rolling first? This is because the integrin is first in a low affinity state, so it does not bind to ICAM yet. It binds to ICAM when it's, when it gets closer to the site of inflammation, and chemokines act on it to activate the integrin. So you can see here when there's rolling. The integrin is not is not activated, and only cell Lewis and P selectin and E selectin are activated, so it's rolling there. And then when it gets closer, chemokines uh, activate both the leukocyte and the endothelium to express ICAM and integrins, so that the uh, so that the uh, the leukocyte can go even closer into the, the endothelium, and then finally go undergo diapedesis, which means it goes through the endothelial cells into the extracellular matrix. This is a difficult concept, so if you don't understand, please let me know. Any questions? Okay, uh, can you repeat? Okay, so first of all, you have three steps. You have rolling, and then you have uh, margination, and then you have diapedesis, okay? So in rolling, it involves three proteins. It involves Cyala Lewis on the uh, leukocyte itself, and then it involves P-selectin and E-selectin on the endothelium itself. This is for rolling. This is for just for the, the leukocyte can get closer to the area of uh, inflammation. And then after rolling, after it, it got closer, chemokines are released from the uh, cells that are the area of information already to cause two things. It causes the expression of integrins, or integrin ligands, so ICAM, and it causes the activation of integrin on the leukocytes. So uh, integrins now can recognize the ICAMs on the endothelial cells. So then you go into margination. So basically the leukocyte now uh, goes closer to the endothelial uh, layer and it goes out of the endothelial layer via diapedesis. I can repeat again if you, do, if you didn't get it. Good, or do I repeat again? Because this, this is the most important part of the lecture. So everything else is, is very, very simple. Okay, and then you might how you can get questions about this in the in the exam is that the question Dr. Abdul might say you know uh, a a patient comes in with uh, with a chronic inflammation so the inflammation is not healing and then uh, he has a problem and then they do tests on him and they find out that he has a problem in the uh, rolling process he has the leukocytes have a problem in the rolling process which of the following proteins have uh, are defected so the leukocytes have a problem in the rolling process what would be the answer Uh, selectin is involved in the rolling process, but if he says the leukocytes have the problem, that means the protein on the leukocyte itself is defected. So if he says the, the, the leukocytes are normal, but, the, but there's a problem in rolling, then yes, it's selectin that has a problem. But if he says that the leukocytes has the problem and the endothelium is, is normal, then the problem is in cellular Do you get what I mean?
So let's uh, let me let me do another question. Uh, same thing. A patient comes in. He has chronic inflammation that's not healing. They do tests and they find out that he has a problem in the uh, adhesion, but the leukocytes are normal. Which of the what, what's the where is the problem and what protein? So there's a problem in adhesion, but the leukocytes are normal. Yes, I can. Does anyone does everyone get this? Get this point? Because he'll he's hundred percent gonna get a question from here. He's gonna say. Uh, uh, like a, a, a patient with chronic inflammation uh, has a problem in uh, the process, like rolling, and then he tells you that uh, the problem is in either in the leukocytes or in the in the serum itself, and you have to identify the protein. So this is a very important point. Do I move on? Okay. And then uh, during the lecture, he said that, uh, what's it called? Uh, he he selected and he gave him the name CD62, Sire Lewis CD15. We never had these names. So I don't know if you're supposed to know them. But memorize them just in case. It's just the other names for the proteins. But we did, we never were tested for them, not in HLS and not in POD. So it's just that there's different names for them. So E selected is CD62E, Sire Lewis CD15. Etc. It's, like, it's just different namings for them. Okay, so now to the progression of inflammation. So first of all, the, the second, like the you're, you're sitting there, you get an infection of a bacteria. You get a cut, and you have infection of bacteria. First thing that happens in the first uh, co first couple of hours is that there is vasodilation and increased in blood flow. This you can see here that there's edema here. So there's increased in blood flow and there's vasodilation. So there's exudate, there's more cell outside, and the first responders in acute inflammation is neut are neutrophils, as we said before. So for the, in the first six to 24 hours, neutrophils predominate. And the neutrophils come in, they, 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 they get rid of the, uh, the infect infection or the damage or whatever it is. And then after that, after, uh, after the first day, after like 24 hours to 48 hours, macrophages come in and clean up the whole site. So they phagocytose neutrophils, and then they phagocytose themselves. So the neutrophils come in, they phagocytose the bacteria, they deal with the damage, and then after everything is dealt with, macrophages come in, and they phagocytose the neutrophils, and they phagocytose everything, and get rid of everything, and repair the process. And then if the inflammation becomes chronic after a while, macrophage, uh, neutrophils will go down, the number of neutrophils will go down, and there will be more macrophages, and more plasma cells or, lympho or lymphocytes. And do you know the function of plasma cells and lymphocytes? The plasma cells. Okay, uh, plasma cells are basically uh, B cells that, yes, they make antibodies. So in chronic inflammation, there will be less neutrophils and there will be more macrophages and uh, plasma cells or lymphocytes. Okay, so we said that uh, neutrophils come in and they deal with the uh, they deal with the inflammation, and then four things can happen. The first thing is that uh, after everything is dealt with, there will be uh, there will be resolution, so everything will go back to normal, and this occurs under four conditions. This is that there is minimal cell death and there's minimal tissue damage. So there's not a lot of cell death. So just lymphocytes, uh, neutrophils went there, killed the bacteria and everything is done. And it uh, occurs in cells that has uh, have high capacity of regeneration. So if, for example, in the skin, you know the skin is rapidly proliferating and changing over a while, but like the whole time. So if there's inflammation there, then there's probably going to be resolution because the cells can re renew themselves. And if the neutrophils manage to destroy the causative agent, and the macrophages manage to remove all the debris in time. So if all of this happens, then the inflammation will go back to normal and everything will be good. Another thing that can happen is abscess formation, okay? Uh, this will happen if neutrophils fail to get rid of the, uh, of the, of, of the bacteria. In this case, it's bacteria. And uh, abscess is basically pus, a, a collection of pus deep inside the tissue. So if, uh, if the neutrophils fail to get rid of the uh, bacteria and the bacteria is pyogenic, if a bacteria is py pyogenic, it means that it, uh, it makes uh, pus. So it's, its infection causes pus. 
So uh, if a neutrophil uh, fails to remove the bacteria and this bacteria is pyogenic, then there will be an abscess formation and the, the inflammation will not resolve. You need interventions like antibiotics and stuff. And then the third outcome is repair with organized, uh, organization of fibrosis. This means that a scar will form. So your, your, uh, your, your tissue will not go back the way it was. You will have a scar formation. So this happens under four conditions. Uh, you can compare it to resolution here. So in resolution, there is minimum cell death and tissue damage, but in, uh, in fibrosis or in scar formation, there's a lot of cell death and there's a lot of tissue damage. And then in resolution, uh, we said if it happens in skin, for example, then everything will be normal, everything will go back because the skin rapidly uh, regenerates. But uh, a scar will form if a tissue has uh, low capacity of regeneration. So for example, in neurons, neurons have a low capacity for regeneration. So if there's damage in the neurons and there's inflammation in the neurons, it will probably be replaced with, uh, with scars or with, uh, with collagen or like fibers instead of be going back to the way it was. Because the, uh, the tissue itself does not have the capacity to regenerate. And then also compared to resolution, uh, resolution there is rapid destruction and rapid removal of debris. But in, uh, in scar formation, the destruction is very slow and there is poor removal of the debris. So all of this will cause the formation of a scar and uh, so that the tissue will not go back to normal. And then the fourth and final thing is progression to chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation is basically inflammation that has not been removed in time. So it lasts, instead of lasting a few hours to a few days, it goes to weeks, sometimes months, sometimes years. So this is because of the inability to remove the agent. So the agent can be is, is, is very persistent. And an example is tuberculosis. Or if you, if for example, uh, so this, uh, if you get, for example, any foreign object stuck in your hand, this will be very difficult to remove by neutrophils. So it will cause chronic inflammation. And it will last for a very long time. Any questions? Uh, which one? Abscess? Yes, okay. So abscess formation is basically uh, if the infective agent is a, a, but it was, uh, a bacteria that causes pus formation. So uh, and if the stimulus stays there, then there will be collection of dead cells, there will be collection of neutrophils, the collection of everything. And uh, this bacteria will cause the formation of pus. And if this pus is deep inside a tissue, it will form an abscess, which is basically a collection of pus with an area, like a closed collection of pus with a fibrous area around it, deep in the tissue. Dr. Abdul Jabbar didn't really focus on this one, it's just there. Good. Okay, so I'll ask a question just to make sure everyone got it. Let's say there is a. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's the, the whole the, it's, it's basically this slide from the lecture. You no, know, there's injury, so there's either resolution, or there is post formation, or there is fibrosis, or there's chronic inflammation. Resolution is you remove everything, everything goes back to normal, everything is healing. Uh, post formation is when there's a lot of accumulation of dead cells, a lot of accumulation of exudate, a lot of accumulation of the bacteria, so it will form something called pus, which is basically a liquid and it's like creamy or like, or like uh, yellowish in color because of the accumulation of dead cells. And it will form an abscess, which is basically a, a deep pocket of uh, of fluid that's for, surrounded by fib fib fibrous, uh, fibrosis. And then there's healing or fibrosis is, is when there's no regeneration back to the normal, but there's a scar formation. And then there's chronic inflammation where it persists. So it's basically just this word written into words. Here. So let's say there's inflammation. If, if, if they tell you that someone uh, came to you with an infection that has been persisting for six months, what type of uh, inflammation is this, acute or chronic? And why is it persisting for the past six months? 
what causes it to persist? So it is, it is chronic, but uh, it persists because the uh, neutrophils are unable to remove the causative agent. So it stays there and it's, it stays for a long time. All good? If you have any question, let me know. And then uh, we talked about what happens in the blood vessels and what happens in the area of inflammation. But inflammation also affects the entire body. And if it's infected in different ways, I'll explain the important ways. First of all, there's endocrine and metabolic ways. So uh, when, when there's inflammation in the body, there will be secretion of two, uh, of two things. There will be secretion of C-reactive protein and there will be secretion of fibrin from your liver. And those, those two things are important. Why are they important? If, for example, someone, uh, go, uh, if a doctor thinks that uh, someone might have an, an inf inflammation or an infection, he goes and takes a blood test and he checks for those two things, C-reactive protein and fibrin. And if both of them are there, then yes, he has an inflammation. And fibrin causes uh, increases something called ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. So basically, when they take a blood sample from someone that has an inflammation, and they leave the blood in the tube out, after a while, the erythrocytes or the blood cells will settle down in the tube. This is called erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And the faster it is, the more likely someone has inflammation. And then another thing is that there's increase of production of glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids basically act as anti-inflammatories to help deal with the inflammation. And then finally, there's decreased secretion of vasopressin or ADH. What was the function of uh, vasopressin, if you remember from before? Thank you. Yes, it's, it's, uh, it basically uh, decreases the amount of fluid lost from the body. So uh, we decrease vasopressin because there's edema and we don't want more edema. So the body will, the, the endocrine system will decrease the vasopressin so there's more diuresis and we get rid of more fluid so we can get rid of the edema. Secondly, we have fever. Fever uh, is caused by interleukin-1. Interleukin-1 will go to your hypothalamus and will increase the, uh, the temperature of your body. This is done for two things. First of all, the leukocytes will have, be more efficient in killing the in killing the bacteria, and uh, a higher temperature is 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 a less less good like it's a worse environment for the bacteria to live in, or the in the effective cause to live in. So when you have an increase in temperature, you're decreasing the the chance of the bacteria to survive in your body. And then thirdly, you have autonomic response. Uh, we said that uh, we said that there is uh, increase in vasodilation in the skin uh, to make sure to so, so that uh, blood cells can go to the area of inflammation. But uh, autonomic nervous system will help like, counter that by redirecting the blood flow to other areas deep, so that the blood vessels can constrict in the surface, so that you minimize uh, heat loss. And then there is also increased blood pressure on pulse so that the blood flow fast, blood flows faster through the vessels so that the leukocytes can reach their inflammation faster. Any question about those three before I move to the next three? Okay. The other three things are behavior. So basically, when, when you see someone that's sick, or you see someone that, yeah, you see someone that's sick or has an infection, you see them cold, you see them shivering, you see that they don't feel like eating, they feel tired, they feel sleepy all the time. All of this is because of uh, chemokine, of cytokines that are released during, due, due to this inflammation that go to the brain and affect various types to cause these effects. So for example, anorexia, or you feel the loss of appetite is caused by uh, interleukin-6, which goes also to the brain, and uh, decreases your appetite, and then somnolence and malaise. Malaise is basically you feel like you're you you do not feel good, but like you don't feel like you're you're well. It's just a feeling of unwell, like that you're unwell during an infection. And then another thing is leukocytosis. Because you have an infection, there will be increased in white blood and white blood cells, and this can be either neutroph neutrophilia or lymphocytosis or eosinophilia. 
Uh, neutrophilia is basically increase of neutrophils, and this basically indicates the uh, bacterial infections. Lymphocytosis is increased in uh, lymphocytes, so B cells and T cells, and this will indicate a viral infection mostly. And you have eosinophilia, which is increased in eosins, and this will indicate that there's a parasitic infection or there is an allergy. And then finally, the opposite of leukocytosis, you have leukopenia. Because you have an infection, so a lot of the white blood cells are going to the area of infection, so they'll get depleted. So if you do a blood test on someone who has uh, someone who has uh, someone who has an infection, and uh, that, that lasts for a long time, and you do a blood test on them, you realize that you'll see that the, the white blood cells will decrease because they've been depleted because of a chronic infection. Any question about those three? Hay fever is a type of allergy, by the way. All clear? No questions? Okay. So now we move on to chronic inflammation. One second. Uh, pointer. Uh, let me get it off chat. Chronic inflammation. So we said that uh, acute inflammation can progress to chronic inflammation if uh, if the if the infectious agent is persisting or it's not getting removed. So uh, chronic inflammation can also occur for other in other, in other for other reasons. For example, if uh, if it's not an infectious agent, if it's for example a uh, a foreign object like uh, silicosis, which is silica is it's a type of uh, sand or something in the, it's, it's type of it's like sand or something that causes that causes irritation and inflammation, but it can't be removed by neutrophils, so it causes prolonged uh, inflammation or chronic inflammation. Or it can be caused, as I said before, by persistent inf infection, like viral tuberculosis is a very important chronic infection. Or it can be autoimmune. So basically, uh, rheumatoid arthritis is basically when your when your when your uh, T cells are attacking the joints. Uh, yeah, that's it. Those, those, those are the three reasons why you can get chronic inflammation. So he might get you a question. It's like, uh, which of the following can cause a chronic inflammation? And one of these will be the answer. And uh, as I said before, inflammation for that, that will last for a very long time. It can go to days, to weeks, months, and sometimes even years. So people with tuberculosis will have a very, very, very long-term infection or inflammation. And uh, an important point is that there is tissue destruction and repair at the same time. So in an acute inflammation, you have uh, tissue destruction. So basically, the neutrophils will go destroy destroy uh, destroy the bacteria and affects sometimes affects the area around it. But then after that's done, you will have repair. But in chronic inflammation, because it's a very long lasting thing, then there is destruction and uh, and uh, repair at the same time. So your body is destroying the infectious agent and harming your body. At the same time, it's also trying to repair itself. So this is an important point that in, in uh, acute inflammation, tissue destruction and repair occur after each other. But in chronic inflammation, they occur at the same time. That's it. Any question? Clear? And now the features of chronic inflammation. So as we said before, uh, acute inflammation is, is mainly neutrophils, but as it persists for a longer time, you will have uh, you'll have macrophages and you'll have lymphocytes and plasma cells. So mononuclear cells, so macrophages, plasma cells, and lymphocytes are mainly in chronic inflammation, but neutrophils are in acute inflammation. Um, and there's, uh, as I said before, there's destruction and healing at the same time. So there's destruction by inflammatory cells like macrophages. At the same time, there's healing by by uh, fibrosis, by so by fibroblasts and angiogenesis or new blood, form, blood cell formation. And I mentioned the name of this when those two happen together at the same time. Do any of you remember what this is called? When there's fibrosis and new blood cells at the same time. Starts with the G, something to show. Yeah. 
granulation tissue. So in chronic inflammation, you have something called granulation tissue. So basically your uh, body is trying to heal the area it was in. So it causes fibrosis, so collagen deposition. And at the same time, there's new blood vessel formation. And this is called granulation tissue. So you know when you get uh, for, you get a cut, for example, in your hand, and then there's a hard, a hard piece of blood on it. And if you remove this piece of blood, you'll see that there's an, a pinkish area in your, on your hand. This is granulation tissue. So this is uh, fibroblasts. Uh, causing uh, deposition of collagen. At the same time, there's uh, new cell blood cells, new blood vessels. Sorry. There. He, he didn't really focus on this, but uh, he might get a question. On what is granulation tissue? Okay. So as we said, again, uh, in chronic inflammation, macrophages are the main uh, are the main cells there. So the same thing happens. In acute inflammation, you have the rolling adhesion and diapedesis of the neutrophils. But in chronic inflammation, it, it happens to monocytes. So monocytes are in the, in the blood circulating. They go to the area of inflammation. The same thing happens, rolling adherent, uh, uh, adhesion and then, uh, and then diapedesis. But there's something important that happens. So when it goes out, it becomes a macrophage. And this macrophage is activated by two things. The first thing is uh, chemical mediators like endotoxin and fibromectin, just, uh, chemical mediators activated. But the more important thing is this, interferon gamma. Interferon gamma is released by T cells to activate macrophages so they can deal with the chronic inflammation. So when, uh, when, it's, when it goes out of the blood cell, it's just a normal uh, macrophage. And then when it's exposed to, uh, to uh, interferon gamma, it, uh, get it gets activated and it does two things. It causes tissue injury, so it, uh, it has reactive oxygen species, it has enzymes like proteases, and uh, it has nitric oxide, which causes damage. At the same time, it releases growth factors like PDGF, FGF, TGF, and, uh, and, and which causes the deposition of collagen and angiogenesis. So this, uh, this active uh, macrophage, after it gets uh, exposed to interferon gamma, it does two things. Remember, I said chronic inflammation has two things at the same time, tissue injury and fibrosis. This is mediated by a macrophage. So it causes tissue injury by reactive oxygen species and uh, other enzymes. And it causes uh, tissue regeneration or tissue repair uh, by fibrosis via release of growth factors, which cause the position of collagen and uh, angiogenesis. So uh, yeah. that's it. We have our first checkpoint. Anyone has, has any question? Any point I didn't explain well? Anything you want me to repeat? It's fine, just tell me. All clear? Okay. So now we move on to the parts where you're gonna have to memorize like 50,000 names. Uh, you have the chemical mediators of inflammation. So we said that inflammation is controlled by a specific set of chemicals that are, uh, that are either released by the cells, so by the white blood cells, or they're just floating through the plasma normally. These, uh, these set of, uh, of chemical mediators, they act by going and binding to a receptor on a specific cell. It can be a white blood cell, it can be the endothelium, it can be whatever it is. And once it binds to it, it can either act to amplify the inflammatory response, so it can recruit more, uh, more white blood cells, or it can dampen the immune response, so it can dec decrease it and help resolve it. And there's an important point where one mediator, so for example, prostaglandins, I'll get into them later on, can act on different different targets and they can cause completely different things when they act on them. So one chemical mediator can go and act on different targets, uh, producing a completely different on each one of them. So it can cause vasodilation in one place, vasoconstriction in one place, increased permeability in one place, and it can cause a fever in the third place. The same chemical mediator. Is that clear? Okay. 
and uh, they're usually short-lived, so they have a very short time where they're circulating. So they still get released, they do their function, and then they disintegrate. And most of them can, if they, if they if they cause for if they if the exposure to them is prolonged, or if, for example, uh, C3A and C C5A are anaphylatoxins, so they can cause a harmful effect in allergies. So they're good, but sometimes they can cause harmful effects. This is when the inflammation can become bad. And then we'll start off with the first chem first group of chemical mediators, which is the uh, derivatives of arachidonic acid. So uh, Dr. Abdul-Jabbar said you shouldn't memorize this pathway. I'll just explain it so you can understand some stuff, but you don't, you're not responsible to memorize any of this. You just memorize the, uh, the names of the mediators itself and what they cause. So first of all, we start with arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid can go into two, two different pathways. It can go to the cyclooxygenase pathway, or it can go to the li uh, lipoxygenase uh, pathway. If it goes through, it goes to the cyclooxygenase pathway, it produces prostaglandins, prostacyclins, and thromboxines. But if it goes to the lipoxygenase, it produces leukotrienes. Again, you're not supposed to know this pathway. I'm just explaining it. And what do each of them do? We go to prostaglandins. Prostaglandins can be vasodilators. They can be vasoconstrictors. They can cause pain, and they can cause fever. The vasodilating prostaglandins are prostacyclin, or PGI2, and then prostaglandins, PGE1, PGE2, and PGD, which are prostaglandins. So vasodilators, you have prostacyclin and prostaglandins. And then you have vasoconstrictors, there's thromboxane A2. And then you have pain. Uh, pain is caused by uh, PGE2. It's not, it doesn't cause pain, but it increases your sensitivity to pain. So for example, right now, if you touch your hand here, nothing will happen. But if you have a paper cut and you touch your hand, you will feel pain. Why is that? It's because prostaglandins, they go to the pain receptors and they, they lower the threshold of pain. So they lower the amount of stimulus you need to experience the pain. So in inflammation, prostaglandins will go to the, uh, to, to, the uh, to receptors of pain and they make them hypersensitive. So any small, any small uh, stimulus will, will cause pain. And then finally, you have fever also caused by prostaglandins. You're not supposed to know how they cause them. You just need to memorize that vasodilators, RPG, prostacyclin, prostaglandin. So a question can come and be like, which of the following causes vasoconstriction? And he can, be, he can put prostacyclin, prostaglandin, and thromboxane, and the answer would be thromboxane. Okay? And uh, the production of all these prostaglandins can be inhibited by two things. It can be inhibited by steroids and NSAIDs which are drugs, non-steroids or anti-inflammatories. The steroids will inhibit this enzyme, so it cannot go, so you can't change phospholipids into arachidonic acid, so you can't make prostaglandins. And the NSAIDs will block cyclooxygenase, so you cannot make prostaglandins as well. So prostaglandins can be inhibited by two things, steroids and NSAIDs. Any questions? Or should I move on to leukotrienes? It's fine, you can ask me questions. It's, it's, it's a difficult concept. Clear? Am I going too fast or good? Okay. So now we move on to leukotrienes. As I said, leukotrienes, it's when arachidonic acid goes through the lipoxygenase pathway. Leukotrienes can, can cause three things. They can increase permeability, they can cause vasoconstriction, and then they can cause uh, leukocyte adhesion and chemotaxis. Uh, increased vascular permeability, which means that the, uh, the, the, the endothelial cells will separate, so more, uh, more uh, white blood cells can go out of the, of the blood. And this is caused by leukotrienes C4, D4, and E4. And then you have vasoconstriction, it's also caused by leukotriene C, uh, C4, D4, and E4. And then you have leukocyte adhesion and chemotaxis. Uh, it's basically, it's, remember the process where there's eye cams and there's rolling and then it goes out. This is increased by leukotrienes B4. So it acts as a chemotaxin. So it calls the, uh, it calls the more leukocytes to the area of the uh, inflammation. And leukotriene pathway is only inhibited by steroids. So it's not inhibited by NSAIDs. So a question can come and be like, uh, which of the following can be inhibited by uh, administering NSAIDs? 
and he can put uh, leukotriene C, uh, C4, D4, uh, E4, and then pr prostacyclin, and the answer will be prostacyclin. All clear? I'll have a table that summarizes everything at the end of the chemical mediators. Any questions? So these are just pure recalls. So you have to memorize that this does this, leukotrienes plus the vascular permeability. This, 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 this. It's not like you, you can understand them, but you have to memorize every single one of them. And this pathway, as I said, again, you're not supposed to know anything about it. You're not supposed to really know the uh, COX or lipoxygenase, anything. It's just for your, for your concept. And then we move on to cytokines. Cytokines are proteins that are produced by your white blood cells, mainly lymphocytes and macrophages. Uh, these cytokines are very, 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 very important. There's like hundred, like there's a lot of, uh, uh, of cytokines. It's like until you look at one, two, three, four, five, up to thirties, forties, fifties. There's more. Like you, you get you get to know each of one of them in POD. But here you only need to know a couple of them. The main two cytokines that are involved in inflammation are interleukin one and TNF. Those two are produced by lymphocytes and macrophages to do various effects. First of all, uh, you, you have the uh, effects on your body or like the, that are actually unrelated to the inflammation itself. So you'll have a fever, you'll increase sleep, you'll decrease appetite. It's the same as these, the shivering chills. Uh, all of these are mediated by interleukins, as you can see here, anorexia is interleukin-6. And then you have uh, endothelial effects. So interleukin-1 and TNF will uh, increase leukocyte adherence they will increase pro-coagulability. You have the coagulation the cascade pal tomorrow, I think. And you have decreased anticoagulant and you have increased uh, interleukin. So this interleukin will cause increase of production of other interleukins. So all of this is pro-inflammatory. And then you have fibroblast effect. So there'll be more fibroblasts in the area. There will be more deposition of, uh, of collagen, more deposition of everything. And there's more remodeling. And then leukocyte, and then uh, they also, as I said before, they increase leukocyte secretion. Uh, you just need you just need to know that interleukin one and TNF alpha basically do uh, like affect various parts of the body to increase inflammation. So they are pro-inflammatory cytokines. I don't think you need to know the, like in detail what it does. So you just need to know that they produce more macrophages and they cause uh, what's it called? They cause uh, pro-inflammatory effects. So they increase the inflammation. All good. And then you have chemokines. So cytokines, we said they act, they act on the inflammation itself. They act to do various effects around the body. Chemokines basically uh, are chemicals that attract other of, a lot of types of uh, of white blood cells. And there is a, there is a specific chemokine for every type of white blood cell. So first, for example, you have interleukin eight, which is a chemokine that attracts uh, neutrophils. And then you have eotaxin which is a chemokine that, uh, that, uh, that attracts eosinophils. And then you have lymphotactin. Can you guess what lymphotactin attracts? So if interleukin, interleukin 8 is neutrophils, eotactin is eosinophils, what does lymphotactin attract? Lymphocytes, yes. So you might get your question saying, uh, Eotaxin is a, is a chemokine that attracts which of the following eosinophils. Or he might say the question, no. Uh, eosinophils are attracted to the site of inflammation via which of the following? Uh, uh, eotaxin. And this is the table I talked about. Uh, basically, you have to memorize every single one of them because he might ask a question about any single one of them and say which of the uh, prostaglandins do which of the following. And you have to write vasodilation or pain. And you can see, remember when I said each chemical mediator can have different effects in other sides of the body? Prostaglandins are a very good example. You can see that they can cause vasodilation and they can cause, they also cause pain and they also cause fever. So one chemical mediator causes three different things. So you have to memorize this stuff. Uh, so for vasodilation, you have three. You have prostaglandins, you have nitric oxide, and you have histamine. 
for increased permeability, so increased what is going out of the blood vessels. You have histamine, serotonin, complements. Remember when some have said that uh, th uh, 3B, uh, 3B goes to three, uh, uh, 2B, splits 3, uh, 3 into 3A and 3B, 3B continues and 3A goes and does something else. This is the something else. It goes and increases the permeability of blood vessels. And then you can also have bradykinins, eukotrienes, activating factor, and substance P, chemotoxins. Again, remember I said 5A goes and does something else. It increases permeability and works as a, works as a chemotoxin. And yeah, everything is pretty self-explanatory. Just memorize them because you never know. You might ask you a question about them. And yeah, checkpoints. Any questions? Anything? You, 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 I would expect you to ask a question because it's, it's not easy. It's not an easy lecture. All good. Okay. Finally, there is the last part of our lecture. After everything is done, after the inflammation is, uh, happens, you have to go back to the original state. So you have wound healing. Wound healing is a process that involves chemicals and interactions between your cells and the extracellular matrix like uh, hyaluronic acid, et cetera, so that your body can go back to the way it was or as close as it was. And it involves six steps. Let's say, for example, uh, I get a paper cut on my hand right now. First thing that happens, let's say and this, there's bacteria on the surface of my hand, so there's an inflammation. So there's an injury that induces acute inflammation. And then after the inflammation happens, after the neutrophils come in, they get rid of the, uh, of the infection. So then after that, my body, my, my wound needs to, the, like the cut needs to go back to the way it was. So first thing that happens is parenchymal cells regenerate. Parenchymal cells, parenchyma is basically your, the tissues of the organ in that area. So for example, brain parenchyma is a tissue of the brain. The heart parenchyma is the myocardium, et cetera. So parenchyma cells regenerate. So you have the skin cells start regenerating. Second step is the parenchyma and connective tissue migrate and proliferate. So connective tissue like fib uh, fibroblasts will go to that area and start the, uh, the depositing collagen to help strengthen the wound so it can heal faster. And then fourth is ECM is produced. ECM is extracellular matrix like uh, hyaluronic acid, uh, uh, gags, so, uh, yeah, gags, hyaluronic acid, all the stuff that helps nourish the cells and helps pro also help in the wound process. And then you have parenchyma and connective tissue uh, matrix G models. So when you have, a, when everything is, is, is deposited, so when the parenchyma cells regenerate, and when the fibroblasts deposit collagen, they don't put them in neat way. They just throw everything quickly so that every, the, the wound can stop, like the, the bleeding can stop, everything can stop. So that everything is placed haphazardly. So it's not organized. So uh, after everything is placed down, you have uh, you have enzymes like proteases and everything break down the collagen and remodel it into organized into organized uh, like organized shape. And then finally, you have increased in wound, or in wound strength by collagen deposition. So the collagen that's there transforms into a stronger type of collagen. So it was collagen type three. It goes into type one. You don't need to know that. Just you just need to know that uh, collagen is deposited to increase the wood strength. All of this is uh, important to, when we go to the next slide. So here you can see that there's inflammation, and then you have the granulation tissue. Do you remember what granulation tissue is? Two things. What was it? What are the two things? No, granulation tissue is basically fibrosis and and angiogenesis. So you have fibrosis, so the, the deposition of collagen and angiogenesis, so you repair uh, blood vessels. So think about it, like you have a cut here, so you have proliferating cells, you have uh, the blood vessels that are damaged, so you need su a nutrient supply there. So you have fibrosis, so you can strengthen the wound, and you have angiogenesis so that you can uh, send blood to the newly formed cells and to replace damaged blood vessels. And then you have a wound contraction. I'll get to what that is in the next slide. So finally, you have 
healing. Healing, there's two types of healing. There's healing by first intention and healing by second intention. Uh, healing by first intention is basically when uh, happens when there is a wound that is very like clean or very simple. For example, a paper cut. So it's just a simple, like, a simple cut. It's a small cut. Uh, like not there's like there's not severe, there's no severe damage or for example in surgery when they do incisions they're like they're careful about the incision so there's not a lot of damage so it heals by first intention I'll explain what first intention is second intention is basically when there is damage but the damage is severe so like burns there's ulcers infractions so like a heart attack uh, those those stuff heal by second intention what's first intention and second intention so. First intention is basically when you have a damage that you have damage that's not that severe. So there's a very small wound, and this wound will close uh, quickly and easily. And there's a high like the, there's a high chance that when it closes, it goes back to the way it was. So there's no scarring; it's, it regenerates. It does not doesn't. There's a difference between repair and regeneration. Regeneration is basically when it goes back to the way it was. Repair is like uh, you, you put collagen, so there's scar formation and stuff. So think about like when you when you when you buy a car, uh, if if you repair the car, you're putting all parts in it. So you're putting different parts in it. So it doesn't go back to the way it was. But regeneration is when you go back to the way it was originally. So there's no scar formation, etc. So healing by first intention is when there's a very small wound, it closes easily. There is regeneration and there is very little fibrosis. So there's less there's less chance of scarring. And as I said, the examples are paper cuts and uh, incisions. Healing by second intention is when the wound is very, very big. So as you can see here, and uh, the scar of fibrosis predominates. So there's less chance of you regenerating and going back to the way it was and more chance of developing a scar. It occurs in a much, 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 much slower rate than first intention. So it takes a much longer time to, uh, to go to, to heal. And there's something called wound uh, contraction that happens. What's wound contraction? So basically, we said that there is fibrosis. So fibrosis is when there is the position of collagen. And let's say here, for example, you can see you can see my pointer, right? I don't know. Here. Okay. So you, you can see here that there's a huge, like a big area of damage. So when here, when there is collagen deposition, the area is still separated from each other. So the collagen will hold both sides of the area and pull them together because it's a large area of damage. So it needs to pull them together to approximate both of the ends of the cut so that they can be healing. It's the same concept as when you, when you do a surgery, for example, or when you have a cut, you fall down and you hit your head and there's a cut, you put stitches. Stitches basically uh, pull both skin sides closer to each other so that the healing can happen. That's the same thing that happens in second intention. Because if there is uh, if there is a big uh, injury, if there is a large burn, if there is an ulcer, the space between both uh, normal tissue is void. So when there is collagen or collagen deposition, there will be wound contraction. So the collagen will pull both sides of the wound closer to cut together, so that it can it can heal faster. Any questions? Clear? No questions? It's the last slide. We're done. If, do you have any, any questions about the entire lecture? And even if it's somehow sport, my part, anything? Anything that I explained quickly that you don't get? About how you ask about the first intention and second intention? He might tell you, like, uh, a person comes in uh, with a burn. Which of the following might will occur, in, uh, in, in during in during healing? The first choice will be uh, rapid regeneration. Second one will be fast healing. Third one will be wound contraction. So the answer is wound contraction. Or they might say, uh, how the uh, how does uh, how does damage how does for example someone has a burn, how what will be healing? Will it be healing by first intention? Will it be healing by second intention? It's it's pretty simple, and it's it, like you'll take this much more like in much more details in POD. This we did, we never we didn't have the slide last year, so this slide was never there. We took this last semester in POD, so like, I don't know why it's here. So there's much more details in it, but Dr. Abdul Jabbar didn't go into the details. Like, so I don't know, like I, I, like 
it's very, very simple. So I don't think they'll ask that much detailed question. So the most important point here is the wound contraction. And that first, uh, first intention is for simple cuts. Second intention is for large cuts and wounds. That's it. Any other questions? Is it clear? If you have any questions while studying this lecture again, if you have anything you want to ask me, here's my number, here's my email.